This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Outlaw's Obsession by Nicole Snow. Narrated by Tatiana Sokolov and Mason Lloyd. 1. Some Wounds Don't Fade. Krista. It was hard to say goodbye to the kid because I knew what was waiting for me up the street. Martin made tutoring easy. Only eight years old and obsessed with Napoleon, he wouldn't have needed me at all if the schools did a better job kindling his interests. His grades are already coming up. I don't know how you'd do it, lady, but you earned this. Here. His mother, Shirley, gushed all over me, pushing the check in my hands. Thanks. I was careful to make sure she didn't see how hard I pinched the scrap of paper when I stuffed it into my purse. I didn't even take a second to look to verify the right amount. There was no point, when every single cent was going to an utter bastard who'd have me by the throat for the next ten years, no matter how much I earned. Shirley gave me one last wave, and I headed for my crappy old beater parked near the curb. I got in my car and tried to collect my wits. It wasn't easy with the evening sun setting over Reading, casting its light across the dashboard. If there was one thing I hated as much as getting paid and forking it over to Big Ed, it was seeing my face in the rearview mirror. The scars were still there. Visible reminders that the Grizzlies Motorcycle Club had wrecked my whole life, and it wasn't going to let up any time soon. Sure, they'd healed about as much as they were going to after a couple months, but my skin would never be the same. Fang robbed away what little beauty I had torturing me in the back room of their clubhouse, all over an internal war I didn't even know about until he began to slice into my face and whisper death threats in my ear. I pulled away from the curb and set off toward the nursing home, trying not to let my scars summon old ghosts. I'd survived, Fang. Hell, I'd helped his own men kill him. Missy, Brass, and that other man I didn't dare think about— saved me from an agonizing end. And I returned the favor by marching out with them as living, breathing proof of everything the Grizzlies' MC's old precedent had done. Half his men couldn't take seeing me standing with Brass and his buddy, cut to pieces. They turned on the devil and his flock of demons. Rabid barely had time to escort me to safety when the shots started going off. When it was all over— the man who pressed the knife into my face was dead. The Grizzlies' MC chapter here in Reading began to change with new guys in charge. Maybe their lives changed. I didn't care to know. Mine didn't. Fang's death didn't change a thing. I was still knee-deep in the same old shit that began long before the monster pressed his blade to my cheeks. Big Ed answered to Redding, but he obviously wasn't interested in listening to the new crew leading their mother charter. He had his own agenda. All the bastards in the Klamath charter did, and they were going to make me pay until I was destitute and bloodless. His bike was already parked outside the nursing home when I got there. A quick stop at the bank turned my hundred-dollar check into cold cash, the only thing he'd accept. I added it to a couple hundred more I had waiting for him— hoping it'd be enough to make up for the payments I'd missed last month. I parked and headed inside. Walking up those stairs was like going into hell. Without Ed, it would have been hard enough seeing my dad screwed up. With the nasty-looking biker hovering in the room like a total thug, it was much worse. How bad would it be today? Would I have to listen to Dad ask me who I was for the thousandth time while Ed stood by, cold and calculating, a grim reminder that there were worse things waiting for my dad than early-onset Alzheimer's if I didn't pay up. They sat in their usual spots when I opened the door to my father's room. There was Dad, staring out the window in his wheelchair. Big Ed was sprawled out on the bed. He bounced up with a muscular jerk. His large gut got in the way, and his trademark handlebar mustache twitched angrily the only thing drawing attention away from his dark eyes. What the fuck took you so long? I got another run to make before I head home to Klamath tonight. Fucking bitch. He spat on the floor. You've been keeping me here all evening. I stepped over his spit and reached into my purse, 
digging for the money as quickly as I could. He watched me while I pulled out the little stash and tore off the money clip. I shoved it into his face, trying not to shake. Here, count it. Everything I promised. He flipped through the twenties, letting out a loud snort when he finished counting. That's it. Babe, you better start coughing up a whole lot more if you ever want to skip these little visits. You're about one dollar over the threshold that keeps me from knocking his fucking teeth out. One, Ed growled, pointing to my father. Dad stayed mercifully oblivious, muttering to himself as a little bird landed on a tree branch outside. It's everything I have this week, I whispered, trying to stay calm for my father's sake. Don't know how I'm even going to make rent, to be honest. I'll have more for you later. Big Ed shot up grabbed me by the shoulders. His hot breath reeked tobacco, sour whiskey, and something else I could never quite identify. It stank plenty. I was scared for Dad, but not for me. Not anymore. Surviving Fang's torture drove away the terror I used to feel when he got up in my face or slammed me against the nearest wall. Stop being such an ungrateful cunt. You know I'm doing you a big fucking favor, right? because we could do things much differently, babe. Trust me. Ed, please. I pushed against his fat chest, but he only tightened his grip. Bastard. I pushed harder, the way he always made me struggle before he finally cut me loose. Too bad it never shut him up. I could shut the door behind you, cut his fucking throat, and take you for a ride north on my bike. Shit. We'd probably be doing the old fart a favor. It's not like he knows who the fuck either of us are or what we're up to. He paused. My eyelids fluttered shut. I quietly prayed he'd stop. He never did. You're a little worn to be a good whore, Krista. But there are plenty brothers in Oregon who'd love to use that firecracker cunt between your legs. A redhead's still a redhead. Doesn't matter if she's got a few scrapes and scratches. He licked his lips, eyeing the shameful lines on my face. I shook my head. I was used to crude comments about my natural hair forever, but hearing about the scars was new. Hearing it from Ed's foul mouth was the worst. Tell me I'm being a good guy, Chrissy. I want to hear you say it. You know how fucking easy I'm letting you off? I'm not even asking you to pay for the gas it takes to get down here just to put your tits into a vice. My bros would kick my ass if they knew what a softy I'm being. My head snapped up and we locked eyes. Was he fucking serious? As if this wasn't humiliating enough. Sigh. I had to spit it out, if only to make him leave sooner. You're doing me a favor. You're playing nice. You're the best debt collector a girl could ask for. I could barely force the words through my clenched teeth. There. Is that what you wanted, you fucking asshole? I hated when my brain felt like burning coal. Every thought hurt, hot and fierce as moving fire. Big Ed laughed. He walked past me, though, moving through the narrow space between Dad's bed and the TV stand. His arm went out and gave me a rough shove on his way out. Don't you fucking forget it, bitch. I steadied myself against the wall, hoping I wouldn't have to turn around before he was finally gone. Then he opened his fat mouth again, and I knew luck wasn't on my side today. Oh, and don't you dare think about going to any of the Redding boys with this. It won't help your ass. It'll just be more trouble. Rip's never backing down. He doesn't give a fucking shit what Blackjack or any of those other cocksuckers say. We don't take our orders from this town. We're free men. And if you stir up trouble, you'll just cause a damned war on your doorstep. Your job's easy. Fucking remember it. Easy? Easy? Now I had to turn around. I wanted to throw myself at him, scream, jab my fingernails into his eyeballs, and tear his stupid mustache off. But it wouldn't do any good. If I somehow survived and got him arrested, his brothers would come to town. They'd know who did it, and everything I'd heard said the bastard was right. The new Grizzly's leadership in Reading was too busy finding its footing. My problems weren't theirs, if they even cared. Besides, I wouldn't dare drag Rabbit and his brothers into this. 
though he'd jump at the chance. They saved me once. I'd already screwed over my dad, and I'd rather die than see anybody else get killed for my screw-ups. My dead. Ed, we're done. Please. He wanted me to beg him, so I did. The asshole stopped, stood up straight, pulled on his cut. He was coming toward me again. No, no, no. What's the matter, Chrissy? Seriously? His voice was so soft, but the way he grabbed my chin and tilted my head revealed his inner demon. You ought to work your little ass off and go on a retreat. You're so fucking stressed. It's no good for your heart, you know. He thumped his chest. The sound was the first thing to really make me shake. It reminded me how huge, dangerous, and ruthless these men really were. Life gives do-overs if you play your cards right. Keep coughing up the dough. Keep doing everything I say. The old fuck over there'll get to live out his days in peace. You'll get to live another week without my boys running a train on your sweet ass, wearing nothing but their cuts. God, I bet you fuck good. Even if you look like you stuck your fucking face into a cat fight. Laughing, he reached for my ass pulled me to him. I had to fight to make sure his disgusting tongue never contacted my skin. Asshole. He let me go at just the right time. I went spinning toward the wall and crashed, hit the TV hard with my hip. Big Ed roared, stomping past me again, this time ripping open the door to the hall. You take care of yourself, Chrissy. Who the fuck knows? The universe works in mysterious ways. You keep working with a fire under your ass— Maybe you'll get to have a little biker bar up by Crater Lake again one of these days. We'd love to give you the fucking money to get it off the ground again, as soon as you pay this shit off. I closed my eyes. Finally he was gone, leaving the thunderous echo of the door slamming behind him in his wake. Just before he disappeared, I caught the roaring grizzly bear on his back, hateful symbol of all my terrible mistakes. Christ, seriously? He'd gotten to me again, even though it took a lot these days. My hand was squeezing my purse for dear life, and that made me realize how fucking empty it was. Just then, Dad chose to turn around and look at me with his vacant eyes. You lost, lady? Can I help you? I stopped and stared up at the ceiling for a full minute. There was one more thing in my purse, something I'd bought with a couple bucks I hadn't forked over to Big Ed. Here, Dad. Your favorite candy. It was a dark chocolate bar I'd gotten at the gas station, something he always liked in better times when he could still fish and ride his bike. With any luck, it might slow the weight melting off him, too. Dad didn't look like the man who raised me anymore. He used to be big and strong and muscular, ready to lift the world. Now he couldn't even lift his own legs to walk. He sniffed, gave me the look that hurt the most the vacant one that reminded me he really had no clue who I was, and probably never would again. The lucid moments were so rare these days. It wasn't fair, damn it. He wasn't even sixty. Four or five years ago he'd been enjoying his first year of early retirement, and now everything he'd scrimped and saved was being used to support him, while every last light went out in his head forever. Hmm. He unwrapped the chocolate slowly, something that had become our ritual for the last six months. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Tastes good. He chewed a square and looked up at me, wonder in his eyes. I sniffed back more tears. He didn't remember his daughter, but I managed to make him truly happy with this little thing. That counted for something wherever my worldly karma was being tallied up. Right? What was your name again, dear? Krista. Krista Kimmel. You can count on me to be here next week, Dad. Same as always. I leaned down and gave him a quick peck on the forehead as his lips formed a confused smile. I don't care how hard anybody makes it. I'm never going to stop loving you. That night, I stared into my empty refrigerator. My stomach growled. Pissed that I hadn't fed it anything since the roast beef sandwich Shirley gave me. I turned away in disgust, gulping two big cups of water to take the edge off. 
Dad was safe for another week, the only thing that really mattered. But I couldn't stop wondering how I was going to keep living like this. Something had to give. It always did. Bad luck caught up to me with trouble right by its side, always wearing a Grizzlies MC cut. I'd been in deep before I got into trouble with the Reading Club. Fang and his monstrous brothers tortured me because I'd been tutoring this teenager, Jackie, younger sister to Missy, who'd been claimed by Brass. He was the VP now, but he'd been one of the main traitors then, leader among the men who ended up destroying Fang and taking over the club. Well, at least there was one less demon in the world. Not that it did me much good. The awful memories weren't the only thing that kept haunting me. Every few weeks, Rabbit came by, quite possibly the only man I didn't mind seeing with a murderous bear patch on his leather. His club sent him around to make sure I wasn't going to go to the cops about anything that happened during Fang's overthrow. They didn't have a clue I'd been avoiding pigs since I was fifteen. I'd been wild, and I'd made Dad's life a living hell for the next few years. Guess it went with the territory growing up a biker's daughter, without a mother to straighten me out. The stupid shit I'd gotten into wouldn't have wrapped around my neck like a noose if it didn't keep compounding. At eighteen, I hitchhiked my way up to Klamath Falls and made the greatest mistake of my life. I was young and stupid. I thought I understood outlaw motorcycle clubs since Dad was in one, but I didn't really know crap. My teenage brain couldn't even compute borrowing six figures from one with double-digit interest. I thought I was tough and wild, thought I could run a bar without letting the Grizzlies M.C. walk all over me. I completely wilted the first time they wanted me to launder money through them. Their president, Rip, got in my face, close enough to feel his beard's tangled bristles. He reminded me exactly what I was, their bitch, not a real businesswoman. I had to get out. I ran and ran the bar into the ground leaving a real accounting mess behind. The whole thing fell apart within a year, but the debt remained. I should have seen it coming. I'd been a smart girl, a trophy winner and a gifted kid, before I flushed my brains down the toilet for adventure. I'd still managed a perfect score on the SAT, even when I was fucking off. I should have seen it coming, but I was too young, too naive, too strung out on hope and smarts. I didn't realize I was missing the magic ingredient, bravado, until it was too late. Some lessons have to be learned on the streets instead of in schools, I guess. My head knew it. My heart refused to listen. The years after Klamath went by in a blur of failures and intimidation, and there I was at twenty-three, slaving away for these savages I'd never escape. God, what I would have done for a good drink to knock me on my ass— the gifted brain I'd never done anything good with sure loved to think. It never shut up unless it was doused in poison. And so I suffered another evening alone, resisting the urge to pick up my cheap pay-as-you-go phone and call up Rabbit. I still had his number. He'd insisted on me taking it, the same way he made me promise to call him if anything came up between his visits. He tempted me to pour my heart out. Maybe more than that, too. The boy, no, the man, was handsome. Six feet tall, broad shoulders, short dark hair, and pristine hazel eyes to match. Lickable was too weak a word for how his clothes clung to the sculpted muscle underneath. The kind of hard, rugged strength a man gets with violence, rather than pumping iron. He couldn't have been much older than me, but his face had experience and wisdom. He wore confidence that said he'd avoided all the stupid things I'd done in my youth. When I let it all lay out, Rabid was a fucking conundrum. He excited me as much as he scared the hell out of me. I hated being attracted to a brother in the Grizzlies MC at all. Too bad loathing the dark men behind the bear patch hadn't stopped me from admiring anything dark, masculine, and heavily tattooed. That was Rabid to a T. Rabid the brave. Rabid the biker bastard. Rabid the enigma who got into my head during dark hours like these, nudging me to learn more about him. Thank God he wasn't perfect. 
It didn't take hanging around him long to realize he was a crazy womanizing biker who partied, drank, and fucked as hard as the rest of them. I had a pretty good idea what men like him did behind closed doors after the bar, and what happened in outlaw clubhouses was ten times worse. I didn't care if Rabbit melted my panties off. I wouldn't let myself get an inch deeper into his wicked world. And even if he wanted me, scarred cheeks and all, there was no way in hell I'd end up in his bed and become one more notch on the bedpost. There were bigger problems to deal with than a silly cat-and-mouse crush. There always were. Welcome to my life. 2. Playing with Fire Rabid Red was riding my cock like a champ, but for some fucked-up reason it was taking ages to blow. My nuts didn't want to give up their fire. Before Krista, this bitch rocking her hips into mine, screaming as she sank down to my balls, absolutely slayed me. Now? Fuck, I was lucky to stop thinking about the chick out of my reach just long enough to bust inside this slut's tight cunt. And I really needed that shit. Anything to sandblast the edges off my stress. Everything Dr. Jack couldn't reach. God, baby! Rabbit! Red growled, grinding her pussy on my dick, staring down at me through half-narrowed eyes. I'm going to pop my spine out of place if you don't give it up. Don't you want to come for me? Her long fingernails raked down my chest. They were painted bright red. What fucking else? The slut was a knockout, and she was all mine. I hogged her to myself, never letting other brothers have this pussy while I was using it, which was all the fucking time when we didn't have some shit to deal with outside these walls. Greedy bastard. Hard not to be when this chick was hot, horny, and just a little crazy. I should have been satisfied with her sucking and fucking me dry, so why the hell was it so hard to let go and float away on Red's pretty skin? Get off, I snarled, giving her ass a sharp whack. I always love the way a chick's butt bounces when I smack it around. On your hands and knees, stuff that fucking pillow into your mouth and swallow your screams. Roman gave me shit about us keeping brothers up last night. She rolled and flipped over, waiting for me with her fine ass up, nice and submissive. It wasn't just an act. She really loved the way I fucked her. The girl never complained about the way I kept her away from all the other brothers. She'd do any dirty, nasty, fucked-up thing I commanded. Had a feeling she was holding out to be somebody's old lady like a lot of sluts. Shame the chick was too dumb to realize that barely ever happened. Whores were for fucking. Old ladies were for loving, and a man in this club never went back to Skeks after putting his brand on some worthy chick. I looked at the clock. Fuck! Already past three in the morning and we had club business tomorrow. The brothers had every reason in the world to knock down this door and beat my ass if I didn't let them get some shut-eye. Easier said than done when I mounted Red's pussy from behind. The whore had a mouth like a siren on her. She was drooling and shrieking like a wild animal just three strokes in. I stopped, reached between her legs, and gave her clit a rough pinch. "'Baby, why'd you fucking stop?' she moaned, desperate as all hell. "'You gotta keep it down. Either stuff that goddamn thing in your mouth like a good girl, or I'll finish myself in the shower.' She loved to be bossed around. I helped shove one corner of my pillow into her mouth before I started thrusting again. I didn't need to follow her gurgles and rasps to know she'd started coming. Her old fucking body seized up. That soft, warm silk around my cock turned molten hot, gushed and locked onto my dick. Her skin heated just as much under my fingertips. I was frustrated as fuck I wasn't there yet. Seriously, what was this shit? I pinched the whore's nipple till her moans went silent, rubbing her clit furiously to start them all over again, never letting up on the bone-shaking thrusts. I'd fuck her right through the goddamned mattress if this kept up. I knew why it felt like a chore. Knew it and didn't want to fucking admit it. Red couldn't get me off any more because she wasn't the one I wanted. Ever since I got my hands on a hotter redhead a couple months ago, I'd been fucked in the head like the chick cast some kind of hex or something. Trying not to think about Krista was like that fucking kid's game where you're not supposed to imagine a pink rhino. In my screwed-up head, it wasn't the club slut thrashing and screaming her throat raw underneath me. It was demure Krista, 
her nice full ass shaking on my cock, full figure tits bouncing in my hand. The hips on that woman were built to suck a man dry, and I'd bet every dollar I'd ever earned her pussies like a fucking virgin's compared to this slut's. Shit! Hellfire turned in my balls, ready to burn a hole through my sack if it couldn't get out. Grabbing Red's hair, I snarled, pushed her face first into the pillow stuffed in her ruby lips. Krista's locks were brighter, softer, gold to this bitch's bronze. My brain wouldn't shut the fuck up once it fixed on her image, and I slammed my cock up to the whore's womb, imagining I was having somebody better. This fuck was all hate. Envy. I hated myself for not being able to get over that chick who wouldn't even look at my dick, let alone let it between her legs. I'd given her plenty of opportunities, too. I had good pussy, at least by any club horse standards, but I still wanted more. I wanted the absolute fucking best. The rickety bed snapped like it was going to collapse when I finally came. The seed pouring out in thick jets set red off all over again. Her spasms went fucking nuclear around my dick, and I threw my head back, growling out a long curse, aching each time I imagined Krista's sweet cunt wringing the cum from my body instead. Fuck! I worked my hips into her, hate-fucking, not stopping till everything below my waist went numb. When it was over, the disgust set in. I pulled out, reached for the bottle of Jack on the floor, and took a long pull. Thank fuck it was still half full. Rabbit, what's wrong, baby? Red wasn't totally stupid. She could sense the change coming over me the last few weeks, ever since we off Fang and started to clean up the shit all this club had become. Nothing this venom won't solve, I rolled over after another good swig, forcing the bottle into her painted fingers. You're not my fucking shrink. You're fun for me and any other brother who wants your ass. Drink your fill and go the fuck to sleep. Okay. Good girl. Smart girl. Any other answer would have stirred the bitter, crazy shit churning in my guts, and I'd have thrown her out of the room so fast she'd be lucky to pick her skimpy clothing off the floor. Red knocked herself out long before I did. I drained every last drop in that bottle, praying it'd be enough to put me down till morning. Luck wasn't kind tonight. It took forever to feel Dr. Jack work his magic. Krista didn't want to leave my brain. Worst of all, my dick was hard again before I nodded off, jealous and hungry for everything I couldn't have, and that really pissed me right the fuck off. Two months earlier. I'd never forget the first time I saw her. She was broken, scared, and just barely made it into the van in time before Fang's goons came after us. Brass's old lady Missy had barely gotten her out of the clubhouse in time before Fang and his loyal bastards closed in. We'd snagged Krista at the last second, yeah, but she hadn't gone according to plan. Both women were supposed to come with us, but Missy was too late. I had to watch her get dragged back into the clubhouse while I floored it. She'd be a goner till the final showdown. The first good look I got at the redhead was in the rearview mirror. I saw right away they had her long enough to do some serious damage. I knew she was hurt, but I didn't realize how bad till I helped clean her cuts later. The angry red imperfections our fucked-up prez carved barely registered. I was too lost in those eyes and the smooth, creamy skin contrasting with the fire in her hair. Imperfections? Fuck that. The first time she looked up into my eyes, bright green eyes glowing, my dick beat like a second heart in my pants. My eyes didn't give a fuck that she was hurt. They were greedy sons of bitches, and they went all over her body, studying her curves while I cleaned her face with a warm washcloth, offering her sips of water from a canteen. The swollen blotches on her face and the scratches left by the bastard Prez's knife didn't hide a fucking thing. The girl was hot, a full-figured hourglass with ample tits and ass. She was a natural, too, hotter than Red or any other whore the club had. Fuck, maybe hotter than any it would ever have. I knew I was fucked for wanting to bet her when she was so hurt. The last thing she needed was a wolf like me breathing down her neck, pawing at her, hungry to shove my tongue between her legs. I had to restrain myself. Tying down my instinct was the hardest thing I'd learned in twenty-four years on this earth, but I managed. I let her rest, guarded her in the back room while the boys in the front plotted one last hit. 
The whole destiny of our club was changing, and I knew I might end up dead. One wrong move was a fatal one in a motorcycle club's civil war. But just then, staring at the red-haired beauty, I didn't give a single shit. She gave me something more to fight for. Brotherhood should have been enough, but damn it, I wasn't sure what it meant anymore with Fang and half the old crew showing their true demon faces. Everything I wanted was right there in the room with me, and I wanted revenge. I wanted to tear Fang and his boys to pieces, almost as bad as I wanted to pull Krista into my arms and tear her clothes away. I was used to hauling tail into my bed or the nearest ditch on demand. Holding back was new to me, and watching her sit still and breathe, shaking every supple part, just caused lava to rush through my veins. I had to splash water in one palm and wipe it over my face several times, wondering if I was dreaming, wondering if I'd melt from the inside out. Fuck! Worst timing ever, too. Blackjack Brass and the Prairie Devils who'd come down from Montana to help us out were all riding my ass to focus on the mission. Brass came up with the fake surrender idea, a trick to get us one last meeting with Fang beneath Mount Shasta. He also had the balls to think up using Krista to hit any of the brothers with a heart where it hurt, make them see with their own two eyes what kind of sick shit Fang and his cronies were up to. When I heard about the plan, I nearly lost my shit. I wouldn't have hesitated to punch my best friend and closest brother right in his fucking face for putting her in danger. But Krista refused. She insisted on playing her part. Fuck. She agreed with facing down the heavily armed sadist who'd left those scars on her sweet cheeks. I tried like hell to talk her out of it, but she was determined. I knew right then the chick was either batshit crazy or she'd already seen some serious shit before. Later, when the moment came, she stepped up with Brass, facing the armed bastards Fang had called in from other charters face to face. Brass made a pretty speech, showing off the girl, making every brother decide right there if this was the club they wanted. When the shots started going off, I went absolutely ape. I grabbed her, forced her to the ground, and covered her with my body while the shots exploded all around. My brothers were in the thick of it, pushing the fuckers back, killing anybody who didn't surrender and give us Fang's head on a pike. Stay down, baby. You move with me. If I get hit, you stay down, too. Ignore whatever happens to me. Don't move till the gunfire stops. Rabbit, it's fine. We're almost— Fuck. She was trying to crawl out from under me. Damn if I didn't grab her, slam her down to the ground, and hold her rough in the California dirt. Just in time, too. Some asshole's bullet buzzed right over my head. A couple inches to the right, and it'd have gone through us both. That did it. She flinched underneath me, yelped, and still I held on, waiting for more shots to come. I was ready for anything to keep this girl safe. I'd let the lead rip right through me and bleed all over her if I had to. Anything to keep her safe. Fang and his assholes put her through hell once. I wasn't going to let them put her through any more. Not because she was the hottest thing I'd ever had wriggling underneath me, but because it was right. The cancer in the M.C. had us all fucked up about right and wrong. It took Blackjack and Brass leading the charge to remind me what this club was supposed to be about. We were grizzlies. We were bikers. We were warriors. We were a shield to everybody under our protection, especially folks like Krista, who'd done us a huge fucking favor while we were busy cleaning house. A few weeks ago, I'd been too scared to vote for Fang's removal when we had the chance to oust him peacefully. Well, more peacefully than this, I still doubted the old dog would step aside without a fight. Now I was hell-bent on making sure all the evil shit he'd done, hell, the fucked-up things I'd done by default, were undone. This wasn't about some high-minded, flowery crap. This was about becoming real men who defended their family, the righteous blood and brotherhood the club was supposed to represent. And God willing, soon would again. Go! I pressed my lips to Krista's ear and said it. Hot and insistent. She crawled forward. I moved with her, grateful the anarchy behind us was quieting down. Somebody had gotten the upper hand. I turned, looked behind me, and let relief pour out my lungs. I didn't see an army of Fang's bastards descending on us. Instead, our boys were rounding up the assholes who'd surrendered, and the ones who hadn't were bleeding out next to the trees. It was going to be hell to clean up later. Right now, all I cared about was putting more distance between her and the battlefield. 
I headed for our bikes and didn't let her move a single limb outside my shadow till we had vehicles between us. Blackjack, our de facto prez, came staggering toward the van with a couple other brothers helping him. Poor bastard had a fresh hole in his leg, staining his jeans dark red. Fuck! The battle wasn't bloodless, but it had to be close to over. We'd won. Fang would be finished soon if he wasn't already. I got on my feet and gently pulled Krista up with both hands. You did good, baby. Seriously. You've done more for this club through this whole thing than anybody could have asked. She shrugged. Common enemy. I'm not the type to let a man torture me and then walk away. He's still got Missy. Not for long, I growled. Brass will find her. She's his old lady. A man in this life never lets his woman down. Never. If you say so. There wasn't much feeling in her voice. That caused my eyes to shift and lock onto her. What the fuck? Did she really believe any of us would leave a brother's old lady M.I.A., resigned to whatever evil shit was waiting for her? Maybe she wasn't as smart as I thought. I'd cut her some slack, seeing how she'd just done us a massive favor. Coming out of any meat grinder can do fucked up things to a person's mind. Walk with me. I reached out, grabbed her hand. One of the brothers tending Blackjack looked up and nodded, a stern-faced dude with a shaved head and lightning bolts on his temples named Asphalt. He confirmed what I knew. We were done here, and I was free to take her home, away from this place with burned flesh and blood curdling the air. I led her to my bike and helped her on it, fixing her helmet. She winced once when my hand accidentally brushed the long cut flowing from the corner of her mouth to her ear. My heart beat hellfire all over again, enraged that the bastard we'd all followed had marked her this way. Sorry, I grunted, strapping her in. It's okay. Just take me home. I need rest. Krista gave me directions to her place, and soon we were heading south toward Redding, ahead of the rest of the crew. Thank fuck I'd get a break from the cleanup duty. It was going to take a lot of hands and some heavy bribes to any cops to hide all those bodies and broken vehicles. On the open road, with her on my back, the shit seemed a million miles away, though. A cool spring breeze coursed through her hair, sticking out the helmet around the edges. I watched it flow in my mirrors and suppressed a smile. This was living. If I ever needed proof we'd both survived and gotten away intact, it was right there on the back of my bike. Beautiful, radiant, and alive. No, it wasn't just her fingers hanging tight around my waist, driving my dick up harder than the steel rod it became in the thick of battle. Having her so fucking close pressed up to me like this did awesome things to the heart. This gal was a feast for all the senses. Something about her made me feel alive without having to hit the bottle or jackhammer between her legs. Oh, you'd better believe I wanted to shake her to fucking pieces, bite her, claim her, and mark her as mine. I wanted to pump my seat in every hot, wet hole she had, having her like nobody ever had, like nobody ever would again. But there was more to this shit, something I couldn't pin down. I'd never been big into philosophy and true love bullshit, so I switched off my brain and rode, enjoying her warmth and the breeze. Shit was getting ridiculous. I wasn't about to shelve the partying I was used to, all for some chick I barely knew who just wanted a ride home. God damn. Maybe it's time you start fucking some variety to get off this redhead fixation. Easier said than done. The minute we pulled up to her apartment and she hopped off my bike, I was gawking like a moron at her long legs and firm, ripe tits again. Thanks for the ride. Guess I should thank you for saving my butt, too, she said, reaching up to undo her helmet. I should have said something sooner. I think you'll understand if I'm a little out of it today. You got every right to be, I said, standing up and putting her helmet away. There's nothing you need to apologize for, baby. It's going to take this club some time to sort out all the shit that happened today. When the dust settles, everybody with a brain's going to agree we owe you big time. Rabbit, no. She held up her hands, closing her eyes like she was sick at the thought. I don't want any favors or anyone to owe me anything. I just want to be done with this. I'm trying to live a normal life here. Fuck. My heart sank at about the same rate my dick deflated. She didn't want to see me again, or any other brother wearing the bear patch. Not like I could blame her. On the other hand, so fucking what? Why the hell was I so disappointed? The chances of ever having this girl were next to nil, but 
fuck if that ever stopped me before. It was just going to take some work. I nodded, trying to look as understanding as possible. I got gotcha. you. I'll be by for the next month or so to check on you. If you change your mind about anything, just shout. I revved my bike, ready to peel out of there and leave her to chew on what I said. But she stopped, put her boot on mine, and tugged on my cut. Her emerald eyes were just like a jaded cat's. You heard what I said. I know you're a smart guy, Rabbit. Look, I'm not going to go to any authorities about what happened if that's what you're worried about. Damn it. She knew us too well. I wondered how, narrowing my eyes as I looked at her. Not my call, babe. All the brothers feel sorry as shit for what happened. We're making the bastards who did it pay, and that's the best we can offer. If it were up to me, I'd cut you loose and never come knocking on your door again. I snorted in my head. Yeah, fucking right. Sounds a little too easy, she said, a snarky smile tugging at her lips. Fuck yeah, it is. The club's gonna have a metric fuck-ton on its plate when our leadership's done playing musical chairs. Plus, we got the Mexican cartel cutting us to pieces further south. Those fucks aren't gonna go for a truce just because Fang's out. They're not easy, like the Devil's MC up north. Krista nodded, almost like she understood. The girl might be wise as she was beautiful, but fuck if I was gonna leave it at that. I trust you, Krista, but the club won't till some time passes. You're a civilian. Blackjack and the rest need to make sure we've got an understanding. It's not every day somebody like you stumbles into our world, and I wish to hell it never happened like this. Oh? She folded her arms, reaching one finger to the bright red cut on her face. Doesn't this say anything? Our understanding's written in blood on my fucking face. Ouch. Those earthy green eyes turned ice cold. I didn't blink. I shook my head, hoping she'd get it if I just worded shit differently. It's not like that. Look, we don't know you from Eve. We gotta look out for ourselves, too, especially with rival charters who won't be happy to see Fang go. We can't risk any run-ins with the feds here in Redding. I can't turn you loose with just your word. I gotta make sure our understanding's really as clear as the hurt on your face. Whatever. Once a week, five minutes. That's all I'm giving you, Rabbit. I don't owe you anything. If I was some weak little thing built to go running to the cops at the first sign of trouble, I wouldn't have asked you to drive me home. I'd have asked for a phone and dialed 911 instead. Christ, it's like she caught my balls and gave them a twist. Just who the fuck was this chick? I'd never heard of a part-time tutor who held her ground like this. If I didn't know any better, I'd have guessed she had experience in the MC world before. Maybe a brother or a father in some club? Trust me, baby, five minutes is all I fucking need. Oh, yeah, I said it. Didn't even disguise the lust thudding in my chest. Never mind the fact that I'd love to spend five hours minimum making her howl and dig her nails into my back. The dagger tongue on this chick just fanned the flames, made me shift my legs to hide the massive wood jerking in my pants. Good. I'll see you around then. She turned, flashed me one last glimpse of that brilliant red hair, and headed for the door. Hey, I yelled to her before she took the handle. What's your last name? She hesitated. I squeezed the handlebars, wondering how I could be so fucking stupid. Think fast. You know, so the club can keep tabs. Make sure your property's all protected from any fucks who want to retaliate over Fang. We won't dig into anything we shouldn't. Promise. I did a quick X over my heart. Crossing my chest meant more than any civilian doing it. My Grizzly's MC patch was inked on my chest underneath the shirt and the leather. When anybody wearing the bear made a promise like this, it fucking meant something. Kimmel, she said, flinging open the door. I watched her disappear. Question time was over. Fine by me, because that last piece was all I needed. Bike purring, I headed for the highway, ready to rejoin my brothers to clean up the battlefield and then lock down our clubhouse. Ours, not Fang's. For now, I had everything I needed. Krista was going to be a challenge, all right. I could feel it in my bones. Taming her was going to be as big and bad and beautiful a task as remaking our whole MC after all the dark times. Fuck if I didn't love the chase. It wasn't a question of if I'd find out what kind of panty she wore to compliment that blazing hair. It was when, where, and the answer was fucking soon. Two months later, on a bright summer day, something hit me in the face. Shit kept coming like a heavy rain, pungent and bitter as napalm. I snorted out Jack. 
Somebody dropped the bottle that was splashing me in the face. I jerked awake, listening to Red yelp next to me. My fists were up, ready to punch whoever the fuck was rousing me like this. The big shape I aimed for caught my hand like a wall with fingers squeezed and crunched my knuckles. Ah, fuck, let go! What the hell's wrong with you? My eyes fought to adjust. Not like they needed to. I knew who it was before I even saw him. Only one asshole in the clubhouse with a grip like that. The big bastard Blackjack appointed to be our new enforcer, Roman. You already know. He reached to the silver watch attached to the wrist about to break my hand and tapped it. Three minutes. Shit. Fuck! I kicked my legs against his knees. Roman never smiled. The fuck rarely showed any expression at all, but I could tell he was enjoying this. He let me squirm for another twenty seconds before he finally let go. I went flying back, fell all over red, shaking out my hand to bring the blood flow back. God damn it. I'd been chewed out by Brass and Blackjack for being late to church the last couple times, but I was used to their shit. The new guy was something else. He was already gone by the time I was up, grabbing my clothes off the ground and throwing the whores on the bed. Rabbit baby, what's going on? You're going to get the fuck out and shake your ass elsewhere. Club business. I'd said everything I needed to. I dressed quickly, not stopping to give her another look. If it hadn't taken me so damn long to fall asleep last night, I wouldn't be rushing around like this. By the time I got into the meeting room, all the brothers were waiting. I took my usual spot next to Brass, who shot me a come-the-fuck-on look. All the more serious now that he was my friend, my brother, and the VP of the whole club. "'Glad you could drag yourself in here late, son.' Blackjack looked like a scorned emperor, his long gray hair flowing down his shoulders. Pull up a fucking chair and stay a while. It won't happen again, Perez. Late night. Fuck, I sounded like a goddamn kid coming in after curfew. Yeah, make sure it doesn't, he growled. One more time and I'll sit you down for a heart-to-heart -heart with Roman. The bulldog enforcer across the table flattened his hands on the wood. All the brothers laughed. He was a good choice for scaring the pants off any asshole outside the club, but I wasn't intimidated. I'd hit bigger fucks before and won. Never mind the fact this guy was in prison while all the drama in the club was going down. Bastard probably had about a hundred special ways to tear my head off on Blackjack's order. Fuck it. The officers had good reason to bust my balls, and it was up to me to make sure I never found myself at the receiving end of the gorilla's fists. Okay, now that all the jigsaws are in place— Let's talk business. Blackjack slapped the bear claw he'd inherited from Fang down on the table, a kind of symbolic gavel. Bass, you want to deliver the latest on the cartel? He nodded, stood up, aiming a laser pointer at the big map of California pinned to the board behind the press. We're holding the line in Sacramento. The heavy shit the devil sent from Montana gave him a few surprises they didn't expect. If all goes well, we might be able to call it our territory and mean it by autumn. I would have laughed if it weren't so damn serious. It was surreal to see my bro treating this shit like an honest-to-God business meeting. Of course, no boardroom outside the military ever let the pins and flags stuck to their board represent human lives. Blackjack turned to face us. Listen well, boys. Every one of you are going to be helping on the runs to SoCal as soon as we've got our old charter in the capital locked down. We're not fucking letting up when the Mexicans are on the run. A couple guys flinched, turned their heads down, mainly the prospects who were new to this war business. Not me. Shit, tearing down the open road and chasing those terrorist head-chopping fucks sounded pretty good right about now. They'd given us hell for the past couple years, creeping north into our territory like weeds. I'm ready, Prez. I didn't hide my enthusiasm as my fist hit the table. Blackjack grinned and chuckled. Keep it in your damn pants, son. You heard brass. We won't be ready for the runs till autumn. Maybe September, if we're lucky. Fuck. That meant I'd have to find some other way to take my mind off Krista and whip my ass into line before then. Yeah, don't get too excited, brother. Brass smiled at me. This isn't going to be as easy as getting Twinkie's lips on your dick after a couple shots. More body laughter. I glowered. Didn't he realize I hadn't taken that blonde bitch for weeks? Last time I did, I had Red's face between her legs while I fucked my favorite from behind, and I was still thinking about Krista. Even two moaning whores under me couldn't wipe that chick out of my skull. Fuck you, brother, I wanted to growl back. 
but showing them they were getting under my skin would only make it worse. Seriously, without the guns and guys from the Devils, we'd be fucked right about now, Brass continued. We're working on getting our own house in order, and it's slow going. Several guys growled, lowered their eyes. Fucking prairie pussies, Asphalt whispered. Blackjack's fist banged the table, and everybody fell silent. Don't make me come down there, brother. I told you all last week that term's banned at church. The devils proved themselves, helped us pull our nuts off the stove before they caught fire. Without those pussies, we'd be sitting in Portland listening to Fang's bullshit because the cartel would own everything up through Klamath. I wanted to whack asphalt on his bald head, once for being a dumbass, twice for being a bro and taking the heat off me. Organ. Roman growled out a trademark one-liner. They still giving the devils trouble getting down here or what? The Prez looked at us like he'd just swallowed horse piss in his glass instead of coffee. Rip's a difficult asshole to get in touch with these days. I'm thinking about sending a couple prospects up there with Roman to deliver a message next week. The big man nodded slowly. He never turned down a chance to throw his weight around. Hell, you could almost say the same about half the guys in the room, but visiting our brothers in Klamath was almost like going into enemy territory these days. What about the Portland crew? I asked. They're closer than we are, and we know those boys are loyal. Klamath's not on talking terms with them either. I tried going through their channels last week. Blackjack picked up the bear claw and sighed, his frustration adding depth to his natural wrinkles. We haven't seen the last bad blood spilling between brothers in this MC. I'd love to have Rip come to his fucking senses and talk to me, man on man, except the new national charter like everybody else. Bullshit, Brass spoke up. You know that's not going to happen, Prez. We can't have our roots choked off by a bunch of fucking turncoats between us and our buddies further north. The cartel will be all over us if they find out. If Rip and his men won't stop being bitches, then we'll replace them with somebody else. The room went quiet. Blackjack was never more severe, deep in contemplation, staring at that fucking bear claw with the full weight of the president patch on his chest. He looked up. You're right, Brass. That's why you're wearing the VP patch. Everybody here has their place. A good crew in Redding doesn't cut it. We've got the best with the biggest balls, and I'm not afraid to let them swing loose. If it hits another charter in the face, then it's for a damn good reason. Shit. Nobody could even breathe. We were seriously mulling more war within the M.C., and going after the Klamath Grizzlies, justified or not, was bound to have serious ripple effects through the whole organization. You don't just smoke an entire chapter without putting your neck under the axe. A lot of the charters downstate and beyond were happy to go along with whoever was in charge, but some of them were sure to be missing Fang's ways, even if they didn't spit in our faces, openly defying us like the bastards just north. One week, brothers. That's what I'll allow before we send some guys up there to send them a message that'll make their fucking ears ring. He held up the bear claw. Do we need to vote on this? The darkness in everybody's eyes said no. I knew mine had the same killer shit swirling around. We were ready for blood, ready for war, ready for whatever was coming. Letting this club slip back into its old evil ways wasn't an option. It would mean the absolute death of us. All right, then. Church is adjourned. Stay on your toes. I'll be calling your asses back here if there's any word. The bear claw hit the table and brothers began to get up. We all froze when somebody started pounding on the door. Roman moved first, walked over, and ripped it open. An older guy with a big beard and a pot belly I'd never seen before came strutting in, our two prospects standing helplessly behind him. Useless fucks. They only got guard duty when all the full patch members were occupied. Or maybe not so useless. The patches on the stranger identified him as a brother right away, and when I turned I saw the big Oregon bottom rocker on the back side. Another turn revealed the name patch on his front right about a V President tag. Big Ed. You're Blackjack? He headed for the Prez and stuck out his hand. Our Prez Rip sends his regards. The new silence in the room was like a volcano getting ready to blow. I stood with brass, trying not to grind my teeth. Roman's posture said one wrong move would place the organ fuck's head between his fists and he wouldn't stop till it fractured. What? No fucking notice before you dropped in? Blackjack snapped. You realize we're at war down here, right? You should have told my crew you were coming. There could have been a nasty accident if you were mistaken for a cartel infiltrator. Big Ed laughed, loud and arrogant, the same way some of the dirty old bastards who served Fang used to sound. That shit instantly set me on edge. 
Come on, I'm here, aren't I? Prez says you've been wanting to get in touch. We're all brothers here. Brass was closer. I watched my brother's face as his VP counterpart threw an arm around him. Brass staggered back against me as he worked himself out of the other man's headlock. I was ready to grab his wrists and hold them so he wouldn't clock the motherfucker and start the all-out war between charters we'd been dreading right here in the meeting room. What? Big Ed looked genuinely shocked that Brass threw him off. Do I look like some fucking Pedro smuggling coke up my ass? You boys are way too jumpy. Fang was never afraid of a little hello from your outstate brothers. There's more to this world than fucking California, you know. That did it. Blackjack stepped up, his fists flexed at his sides. He was older than the rest of us, but he was wiser, too. I wouldn't have counted him down any day, even against a big man like Ed. This club's under new leadership now. Mine! My patch trumps yours, and it trumps Rip's, too. I know damn well what Fang did. He didn't tolerate any disrespect, and neither do I. Blackjack's fist went flying. It collided with Big Ed's jaw. The dumb bastard lunged for the prez a second later, and everybody piled on him. I held one fist while Roman got him in a headlock, squeezing off the fucker's windpipe till he started to go limp. I swore the big man was smiling behind his expressionless mask, ready to hold on until the Oregon VP's lights went out and never returned. Prez! Brass looked at Blackjack with panicked eyes. This fucker's a disrespectful, deviant piece of shit, but isn't it a little early to kill him? We need to find out why he's here. Blackjack stared a moment longer. Big Ed's hand was starting to go limp in mine, ready to fall over with the rest of him. Finally, the Prez nodded. Let him up. Ed tumbled to the ground, coughing and spluttering. He winced when his knees hit the floor. Blackjack stepped up, stabbed his boot on one hand. The fat man roared as his fingers crunched beneath it. You want to be our brother? Then show me we can trust you and the rest of your crew. Get Rip on the line right fucking now and we'll forget this disgrace ever happened. Prez flashed his angry eyes at the rest of us. Everybody out. This is high-level business. I'll call if our friend here wants to try anything stupid again. Brass and I exchanged wide-eyed looks. If some crazy shit wasn't a weekly occurrence here, we'd have needed to pinch each other to believe it was really happening. You found the right pussy to take your mind off the redhead yet, or what? Brass knocked back his second shot of whiskey at the bar. I'd barely touched mine, knowing the bullshit questions would start. Good thing I came prepared. Hey, man, at least I can still pick and choose my chicks as I please. One of the many advantages of not being strapped down with an old lady. He laughed. <laughs> Brother, I get the only pussy I'll ever need whenever I want it. Fuck, Missy's become insatiable since I put my brand on her. I'm lucky to get a few nights with more than five hours of shut-eye with all the fucking we've been doing, and I still manage to drag my ass in here on time. Low blow. Bastard. Who was I going to have to punch to get them off my ass? Come on, don't be pissed. Drink your medicine. Grinning, Brass slid a shot into my hand. You know I'm just fucking around. Prez is going to be pissed if you fuck off duty again, though. I told you it's not going to happen another time. I've learned my lesson. I'll kick the whore out of my bed the night before we have church next time. You? Sober up and keep your dick dry? He smoothed a tense hand through his hair. Who the fuck am I talking to? That's not the rabbit I know. And you're not the same junky asshole I first met when you transferred down here, I growled. That shut him up. Brass really was a different man now. He'd cleaned up, grown a conscience, and turned his fucked up life around. He'd even reconciled with his sister, Saffron. Amazingly, the fact that she'd married the head of the Prairie Devil's M.C. Montana, Blaze, hadn't even stood in the way. He also liked to pretend the times he was pumping shit into his veins never happened. I'm trying to help your ass out, Rabbit. You've got your head screwed loose ever since we rescued that scarred chick from Fang. Let her go. The whole fucking club knows she's not going to talk. You don't have to keep checking in on her and stroking this whatever the fuck this thing you have is. Gotta make sure she's okay. Every time we talk, I can tell something's eating her. Don't think it's related to our old prez slicing up her face, neither. Brass shrugged. Your time to piss away, brother. She's not into you. Fuck, you ran her name through our intel like a fucking creep, and you still didn't turn up anything. Fucker. The jack was starting to kiss my blood hot, and my fingers hummed like they were filled with shrapnel. I'd show him who the fucking creep was. Before I got a chance, the meeting room's door swung open. A stern-faced blackjack held it and watched Big Ed limp away, heading for the bar. 
He kept his distance, and the bartender handed him some ice for the new bruise he undoubtedly had blossoming beneath his bushy beard. Ha! Huh. At least we know they didn't kill each other in there, Brass growled. We both followed the asshole with our eyes, and so did several guys hanging further back in the clubhouse. When Ed was done collecting his ice, he grabbed a bottle of Jack, popped it open, and chugged at least a third of the shit right down his gullet. Jack off. That meant he was going to stick around for a while, oblivious to the fact nobody wanted him here, or else wreck his Harley on the return trip to Klamath. Either way, I wasn't going to wait around for it. I guzzled some water and slammed my glass down, ready to hit the road. Glad I'd only downed a little bit of liquor and wouldn't have to wait to drive. Brass reached out and caught me by the shoulder as I was sliding off the stool. You're going to see her again, aren't you? None of your fucking business, bro. You told me whatever happens isn't club business anymore, so I'm not sure why you care. Brass furrowed his brow. He hated it when I crammed his own words down his throat. You can't keep this shit up forever, he snapped. I don't want to see you go through the ringer because you're so drunk on this pussy you can't even have. If she wants you gone, then go. It's fucking miserable watching you self-destruct over something this stupid, brother. Chris is not stupid. She needs my help. I practically ripped my cut, tearing out of his grasp. Whatever. I wasn't letting Brass or anybody else stop me from a date with Destiny. If she finally went my way, then maybe the sassy redhead would give me a proper date, too. Fuck, I'd sit through all the wine and movies she could handle for one night with her. Whatever happened after that was anybody's guess. I wasn't going to force it. I was looking for a good, raw fuck I'd never forget, one perfect moment interfacing with her like no man ever had. Of course, I wasn't stupid, neither. Something told me if I got her panties off and twisted that bright red hair in my hands, I'd never settle for anything less again. True love? I didn't fucking believe it. True lust was definitely on the radar, though, a desire hissing in my veins, turning me into a total feral animal till I had her. On the way out, I was disgusted to see Big Ed. He had his bike parked just outside our open garage. The crazy bastard was strapping himself in for a drunken ride to God only knew where after all. Fuck, I didn't have time for this. I got on my Harley and fixed my helmet, letting her familiar growl roll through me. Hey! I barely pulled out a couple feet when Big Ed yelled, unsure why I was stopping for this asshole. You're Rabbit, aren't you? I nodded, wondering how the sack of shit knew my name. Why do you care? That nasty laugh came again. Ha <laughs> ha, so you're the guy babying Chrissy. Good to know in case it comes down to fists. One on one this time. You're like a hundred pounds lighter. I'm not going handle that. My heart did a flip. What the hell was he talking about? I was about to get off my bike and demand answers, but he moved surprisingly fast once he was on his bike. He took off, tearing down the narrow lot straight toward the gate a prospect opened for us. Shit. I was originally paying Krista a visit to clear the fucked up fog in my head. Now I had to see her. I had to find out what the hell was going on. Brass and everybody else could fuck off with their stand-down bullshit. I'd get to the bottom of what was really going on with this chick, and I wasn't leaving her alone till I did. 3. Sweet Pursuit Krista I was finishing up a tutoring session with Jackie Thomas when I heard the motorcycle's growl. What's Brass doing here? The fourteen-year-old blinked at me, relieved to have a distraction from the tough math problem we were wrapping up. Who could blame her? The way the schools were teaching this crap required a Ph.D. to figure out. Probably looking for your sis, I said. Her sister, Missy, was Brass's old lady. I expected her to come by any minute to pick the girl up, but maybe she'd send her old man to do it instead. I rubbed my nose. Ugh. I definitely wasn't in the mood to see anyone else from the M.C. after Big Ed's recent visit. You know, here's a good place to call it done for today. We can pick up on this stuff next session. The summer classes move slow, don't they? Yes. God, I keep telling them I know all this. I can figure out the right answers. It's showing my work that's the problem. Just a couple more weeks. No surprise. Smart girls like her reacted the worst to this remedial summer crap, purely because she'd missed a few weeks earlier this year. I was the same way. You're getting it, I smiled. It's all political, Jackie. They just want you to show your work their way. Welcome to the real world. Unfortunately, 
We've all got to deal with its crap. The teenager puckered sourly. Don't I know it, Krista. I dropped my eyes, helping her gather up her things. She wasn't kidding. Both her and the big sister Brass, claimed as his girl, had been through hell after their father died. When Missy first hired me to tutor the kid, they were keeping their distance from him, and he was the only thing protecting them from the grizzly's wrath. Something about their dead father's troubles and some money that was owed to the club seemed eerily familiar. Of course, the club got off their throats as soon as Brass stepped in. He remedied everything, and in the process, Missy had fallen for him. She happily wore her old lady jacket nearly every time I saw her. Property of Brass, branded on the back like she was some kind of pet. I shook my head. No way, I wasn't the submissive type. That thing would never be for me, no matter how hot some of the guys were on their wheels. I'd tasted the sour side of MC life, and it stuck with me. If there was a sweet side, I wasn't interested in jumping through hoops to find it. I wanted to make my money, pay my debt, and move on to bigger and better things. Someday, I told myself. Someday. Hey, it's not brass. Jackie was peeking through the blinds. They snapped shut when she pulled her hand away. That's rabid. Shit. I got up as calmly as I could, deafened by the alarm bells blaring in my head. Seriously? Why couldn't he just leave me alone? I'd be okay. I could take care of myself. He bailed me out once, and I was grateful, but I didn't need him looking in on me like a kid. I sure hope your sis shows up soon, I said. Come on, let's wait outside. And let me find out what this asshole wants now, I thought. It never ends, does it? Jackie stayed on the porch, sipping passion fruit tea from a glass bottle, giving me some much-needed space. Rabbit stopped and slowly took off the shades he was wearing to block the evening sun. My hopes he'd be ready to catch hell vanished when the sunglasses came off. His dark eyes shined bright, angry, and full of accusations. Damn, I didn't need his shit today, and I definitely didn't need a pissed-off biker on my doorstep. What's going on? I said, praying we'd get this over with quick. Didn't know it was time for my weekly parole talk with the club. Not today, babe. Cut the shit, he growled. I want to know what's really going on with you, and I need to know before the sun goes down. What's that supposed to mean? The ferocity in his tone surprised me. It also set me on edge. And why is my life any of your fucking business? Because this ugly fucker from Oregon, who just came by our clubhouse, mentioned you by name. We're not on good terms with him and his brothers. If you're in some sort of trouble with a fucked-up charter at our throats, that's something I need to know about. Your business is my business. And it's club business, too, when it gets tangled up together like that. Oh? So it's not just you trying to play White Knight? He bared his teeth. Of course I care what's going on here. You know I'm not interested in letting the rotten parts of our club hurt you again. I'm here to help, Krista. And maybe you'd figure it out if you'd lay off the venom for a few seconds. I shrugged. I need to wait for my student to leave before we can talk. Will you at least give me that? He looked at Jackie and then did a double take. Shit. Figures every fucking thing I do gets back to brass one way or another. All right. Just get on my bike and we'll make sure she gets home, okay? He wasn't asking. Something about the raw, possessive needles in his voice infuriated me, as much as it made me curious. He'd always been super polite before, every time except the day we were getting shot at. He was so powerful, so protective when he held me down in the dirt, edging me to safety. He would have taken a bullet for me. I guessed that counted for something— just not enough to make me grin and drop to my knees when he stepped into my life uninvited. I couldn't be blind to this. To him? Rabid was a bastard. No, I couldn't deny he was good at what he did. But the good guy mask he wore other times was just an act. The leather hanging on his shoulders with the growling bear's blood red insignia told me what he really was. An unrelenting bastard as harsh as men like Ed, even if his heart was in a better place. 
Like him or not, there was no saying no today if I wanted to avoid more crap. I took the passenger helmet from him and strapped it on while we sat. Missy's car pulled up about a minute later. Jackie came running and hopped into the passenger seat. Couldn't blame the girl for running away from this drama when she had the chance. Just then, I would have killed for some good old-fashioned teenage drama instead of being mixed up with this biker. I watched Missy emerge from the driver's side and come toward us, fishing through her purse on the way. Her transformation was incredible. The plain, shy, scared woman I'd first met was totally gone. She stabbed the heels of her new boots into the ground like she owned it, and her chestnut locks caught the setting sun. She radiated pure confidence, breaking into a wide, amused grin when she reached us. "'Here's the cash,' Missy winked, pushing several crisp twenties into my hand. "'Great. Food money for the next week. Thanks. Since when are you going for rides with Rabbit?' Her eyes flitted to the stone-faced biker, who grunted a response, all he could do to hide the fact that he wasn't just asking me out for a joyride. "'We need to catch up one day soon, girl. It's good to see you expanding your circle beyond my little sis.' "'Something like that,' I said. "'I've always wanted to ride. I thought Rabbit would be the perfect man to show me how.' His shoulder jerked when I laid my hand on it. His eyes caught mine through the mirror, and I smiled when I saw his eyebrows were up. Guess he never expected me to be a good girl and play along. Whatever. It was kind of fun to screw with him. Least I could do to get back a little of the frustration he gave me. I'd appreciate it if you keep this mum between the three of us, Rabbit said to her. Brass is really cracking the fucking whip lately. Every minute I'm spending outside the clubhouse isn't a good one. Missy laughed and stuck her tongue out. Tell me about it. I'm about to head home for another evening trying to calm his ass down. He's so wound up anymore. I'm glad you're getting out and enjoying yourself, Rabbit. Both of you. Your secret's safe with me. She smiled and pushed an imaginary zipper across her lips. I nodded, mouthed a thanks. Incredibly, I'd be spared the embarrassment. It was amazing to think the tension between us was truly invisible to everybody else. Right now, it felt like we were sharing the same noose ready to swing tight around our throats and suffocate us. "'Use some of that to buy yourself something fun,' Missy said, pointing to the wad in my hands. "'I'm sure I'll find something.' I tucked the bills into my pocket. "'Don't let Jackie waste too many of these summer evenings on her math. We're only young once. She's a smart girl, and it's all coming to her bit by bit. She'll have the rest figured out in no time.' Missy rolled her eyes. I'm pretty sure your lessons are the only thing she's studying at all. It's hard to keep her in most nights. You know how teen girls are. Stir crazy. I'm kind of glad Brass isn't allowing any boys in, though. I plastered on another big fake smile as Rabbit revved the engine. We're all just looking for some fun. I'll see you both next week. No more waiting around. The bike jerked forward, shooting along the asphalt, ready to take us wherever the hell he wanted for this talk. I had to keep my hands on him the entire time. Not knowing what he was really feeling was the hard part. His other courtesy visits were so much easier to brush off than this, and I could read him like a clock. Now I barely recognize the demon gripping the handlebars and taking us outside Redding city limits, sending us north while the sun slipped below the horizon. He was so warm, so hard, so omnipotent, guiding this rocket on wheels into the country darkness. The less sure I was about him, the harder I clung to his waist. I saw my face in the rearview mirror, trying to keep it together. He wanted me. I wasn't blind to it. What I couldn't figure out was why. I'd seen the kind of women outlaw bikers hung around when I had the bar. The same women Dad had flings with when he used to ride— most of these guys only wanted trashy-looking whores with big boobs and gumball butts. Their lips painted every pornographic shade I could imagine, and several I couldn't until I actually saw them. The old ladies were sweet, at least for the good, lucky men. They stood by their guys with their knockout looks and hearts like nails, ready for an endless power dance, treating their brands as seriously as wedding rings, when the love was really special. It was beautiful when it was done right. 
I didn't know what Rabbit was looking for. Maybe more than a hard night of fucking, but I couldn't get over why. What the hell did he see in me? Big Ed and the other bastards in Klamath shredded my confidence, and their dead national president stole my looks. It was gone before they ruined my beauty. I barely cried and screamed when Fang slid the blade across my face. Somehow I knew I was destined to suffer. Call it bad karma for getting too deep into a lifestyle that was never meant for me. I thought I was tough, ready to grab the world by the throat. When I went north to start my bar, the world had showed me instead, and now it was slowly choking my life away, piece by brutal piece. Of course, some of these biker dudes were twisted. It took more than balloon tits and sugary lipstick to turn their crank. Maybe Rabbit was one of them. Maybe he got a hard-on for scarred chicks. And I was supposed to be his latest fetish conquest. To hell with that. I wasn't anybody's conquest, whore, slut, or girl. I wasn't desperate. I was perfectly content to live out my days all alone. Maybe see what the world had to offer in the way of nice, boring dudes who worked in cubicles and left the sting of motor oil to their mechanics. Badasses were fun to look at, and even more fun to ride. But they weren't good for me. I'd never be anything more than a toy for a man like Rabbit. And an intact heart was all I had left to my name. I swore I'd keep it that way, too. Temptation be damned. The bike slowed as we approached an old dirt road. It coiled around to an abandoned ranch, some place he was clearly familiar with. Jesus, Rabbit, I knew you wanted privacy, but I didn't think we'd be going so remote. Staring up at the stars beginning to sparkle in the sky made me want to eat my words. The middle of nowhere could sure be beautiful. Thought it'd be calming. It's easy not to get pissed and talk like rational people when the scenery's pretty. He got off the bike, unfastening his helmet, and then taking my own. I grudgingly took the hand he extended to help me off his Harley. We walked toward one of the old buildings, a storage shed that had seen better days, judging by the holes ripped in the sheet metal. This bench is still good. We won't fall through it. He pointed to an old wooden love seat near the back. It was the kind that had a little swing to it when you sat down. The hinges creaked, but not nearly as bad as I expected based on the age. Okay, so tell me, what is it I need to say to convince you I'm a big girl who can take care of herself? Start by telling me the truth, Krista. Nobody thought you had any connections to this club before Big Ed showed up. Shit, even Fang's old goons who turned to our side acted like they didn't have a clue who you were. There's history here. Don't bullshit me about it. Yeah, history. Not with the Reading Charter. You're wrong about that, I said, locking eyes with him. I spent a few years north of here. I wanted to be free and wild get away from living with my father. I had some cash saved up, so I started up a biker bar outside Klamath Falls. Always thought it'd be a stepping stone to bigger and better things. Shit. His eyebrows quirked up. I never would have guessed you for a biker chick. Born and raised. Dad spent twenty years in the Klondike Killers. He rode with them all the time when he wasn't out fishing Alaska's short summers. He retired his colors as soon as he came to Grizzly's territory, though. I didn't mention the Alzheimer's. I wasn't going to lay all my cards out for him, only the ones that were relevant to get him off my back. Holy fuck, baby. Those guys were badasses. Grizzlies used to do business with them out of Seattle and Bellingham, before everything went to pieces. Damn good thing the crazy fucks never expanded past the Yukon. He shook his head, then fixed those bright, honey-colored eyes on me again. That still doesn't explain why the fuck you're tangled up with a motherfucker like Ed. Ew. I wrinkled my nose. That's not an image I want. It's not like I ever fucked him. Come the fuck on, Rabbit growled, something like jealousy lining his face. You know what I mean. How does he know you? Well, when I ran the bar... I couldn't do it with what I scrimped and saved as a teen. Even Dad's contribution couldn't do the job. No bank was going to loan money to a 19-year-old kid with no business experience and no degree. I went to the only ones who could. 
He slapped his forehead. Fuck. Of course. I always heard the crew up there was looking for new fronts to help launder their shit. And I wouldn't let them, I said, remembering the blowout arguments with Ed, Rip, and the other Klamath boys, who'd nearly cost me my life. They gave me the loan in the first place because they thought I'd be easy to control. Who better than some little girl they could push around? Except I wouldn't roll over. The money dried up. The bar wasn't bringing in the kind of business it needed to survive, let alone thrive. I couldn't make the payments, and my booze dried up. I walked away owing the city a few hundred in licensing fees, plus a little over a hundred thousand to your brothers north of the border. Rabid stood up, his nostrils flaring. Son of a bitch. This is bad, baby. Real fucking bad. I have to tell the club. We can get those assholes off your back. No. I reached out and grabbed his hand. His fist was so hard he could have beaten down the old rickety farmhouse on the hill in front of us. I'm taking care of it. Look, we'll both agree Big Ed's a piece of shit. He's a fat, crude bully. I hate dealing with him. He only comes and gives me crap when I've fallen behind on my payments. Rabbit spun, pinching my fingers tight in his. Then let me. I can't do that. I know about the bad blood in Reading right now. Your club's still going through major changes. I'm not blind, Rabbit. I can see you're on edge, a heartbeat away from tearing into them. Damn straight, he growled, jerking me out of the seat. Those fuckers haven't listened to the new officers since we wasted Bang. They fucking spat in Blackjack's face. And now they're not following the protocol for club debts. Redding's our territory. That means everything in it dealing with club biz is our goddamn business first. Including anything you owe, babe. No, no, no. This wasn't turning out the way I wanted. The bright mad spark in his eyes was way too seductive. He gave me hope I never asked for. I wanted his protection. I wanted him. Hell, I wanted to throw myself at him, scars and all. I wanted to feel his massive arms wrapped around me, savor his energy, his belief in a world that still had black and white without endless suffocating gray. This was dangerous, very, very bad. If I let him pull me into the dark ink coiling up his arms, I'd never want to leave until I let him drag me to bed, naked, whimpering, and, worst of all, wanting. I couldn't indulge this attraction, no matter how tempting he looked, or how many ways his powerful arms promised to smash Big Ed's ugly face. Sending him and his brothers after Ed would only end in more bloodshed. I couldn't risk their lives, and I definitely couldn't risk Dad's when Klamath retaliated. I took a deep breath. Please, please listen this time. Please. Rabid, look. I can handle this. I've been paying these creeps for years. Ed only shows up to collect when I start to fall behind, like I said. If I keep the money coming, he leaves me alone. You can't. Shit, babe, I saw the way you're struggling when Missy handed you that cash when she came for her sis. You fucking needed it bad. He paused, and I lowered my eyes. Shameful. Was I that easy to read, or was this man just that tuned in to me? Besides, no club gives debtors an extension without a damned good reason. We're outlaws. When we loan money, there's interest in blood and broken bones. Defaulting's a fucking death sentence, he said, shaking his head. Baby, you're smart, and I'm not going to treat you like a damned fool. But you're playing with fire here. I'm telling you straight up, this shit's more than you can handle. You're going to get burned sooner or later if you piss these guys off. Don't you think I know that? I snapped, jerking away from him. Rabbit wasn't taking any shit. He grabbed me by the waist and pulled me close. My face burned. I couldn't tell if the blush in my cheeks was hotter, or if it was the pulse pounding in my temples. He sure had a knack for making me angry, ashamed, and totally aroused all at once. Three big A's crashing through my system simultaneously, hurtling toward overload. Of course you do, he thundered in my ear, low and dangerous and so damned close. 
You held up like a serious hard ass after what Fang did to you. Fuck, after that ordeal? We're the ones who owe you. Granted, it's hard as hell to make the fucks up in Oregon listen to anything right now. I'm talking to Blackjack tomorrow. I'm gonna demand he twists those fuckers' balls till your debt's wiped clear. Every charter might have its own business, but you're in our territory. We're the mother charter, damn it, and we run the whole show now. No amount of determination in his voice meant this was any less insane. The reality was something different. The MC was still at war with itself and the Mexican cartels. Rabbit's men needed help from their old rivals, the Prairie Devils, just to topple Fang once and for all. They were in no position to wish my six-figure debt away without some serious consequences. I shook my head so hard it was dizzying. I'm the one who made the mistakes that landed me in debt. Me, Rabbit. Nobody else. I'm the only one who should pay. My scars were burning. It always happened when I forced back tears, leaving me to wonder if my skin would ever totally heal. You saw what kind of man Ed is. He won't just drop it. He won't be bossed around, and neither will the other men up north. I met them all when they came to my bar. Jesus, if I could take it all back, I would. I never would have run off and acted like a stupid kid. That's life, baby. We all fuck up sometimes. That doesn't mean you gotta let the past eat you alive. This shit's not like filing Chapter 7, and you know it. The Klamath fucks won't let you have a second chance till you're so worn and beaten. It's no chance at all. That's the fucking problem, and that's why I'm not gonna let them get away with it. He paused. I gasped and shuddered when I felt the hardness between his legs. I'd been leaning into him, and he was like a rock, crazy with desire. We were so alone and isolated out here. Anything could happen if I let it. I turned to face him, wishing my face didn't look like a scratched-up tomato. He was even more insane than I thought if he was seriously attracted to this. I had nothing to offer him but trouble, a damaged body, and a rotten past I hadn't figured out how to reconcile. And I hadn't even told him about poor Dad. Jesus, he was so hard. The thick, throbbing lump in Rabbit's pants was a terrible distraction. I should have spit in his face for inserting himself into my life like this, totally uninvited. But all I really wanted to do was drop to my knees and feel his cock in my mouth. His eyes burned fiercer than the stars overhead. When my eyes caressed his body, I imagined what his tattoos looked like underneath his clothes. Those big black stripes on his arms probably rolled all the way up, lining the fearsome icons on his chest like all the other bikers I'd seen shirtless. This body invited questions, filthy curiosities and wonders, and bathed my brain in fire. Would he look more ferocious than the roaring bear inked on his chest when he fucked me? Would I suck his tattooed skin into my mouth and bite down hard when I came? Jesus, would I ever stand up again if I gave in to one night with this dark Adonis, pretending to be a man? Half the guys in the Redding Grizzlies charter were younger, harder, and hotter than most of the old bastards and greasy criminals who'd visited my bar in Klamath. Without the leather cut and a few less scars on his arms, the man with his hands sliding up my back would have looked like an underwear model. But no pretty boy modeling ever smelled like this. I couldn't stop inhaling him, and that only made my breaths more erratic, betraying the insane desire I was desperate to hide. No, I couldn't actually let him see how hot he made me, but I couldn't stop myself from shaking when I pushed my face into his chest and inhaled— filling my lungs with badly needed oxygen. Pure masculinity caressed my nose. His feel, his smell, his everything burned deep, melting me from the inside out. My body understood, even if my mind didn't. This was a warrior man right down to every molecule, loyal to his club, comrade to his brothers, ready to serve and protect me when I wanted none of it. Also, more than ready to slip inside me making my body shake and scream in ways I'd never even heard of. Fuck. What? What the fuck is it? He growled, his hot breath pouring across my neck and up my ear again. 
too much. I pushed against his chest, stumbling backward in the night. The jerky motion combined with the sudden breeze blowing in behind me, forcing me to realize how tingly and wet I'd become. Holy, holy shit. I hadn't been this soaked for a man since... I couldn't even remember. Probably ever. I need to go home, Rabbit. It's getting late. My words were so weak. Can't we be done here? He straightened up, turned toward his bike, a little too fast for my liking. I couldn't tell if he was disappointed I hadn't broken the tension with a kiss, or if he was just trying to hide the wicked heart on pounding in his denim. Sure, let's go. We're finished as far as I'm concerned. Without looking back, he headed for the bike. I took one last look at all the old buildings. Seriously, what was this place? It's like he knew this abandoned farm. Rabbit? I whispered his name a couple more times as he handed me my helmet. Great. Now I was feeling bad about acting like such a bitch. Don't, baby. The shit's not about wounded egos or who's right. Hell, or even who's been wrong in the past. You told me the truth. That's what I really wanted tonight. The rest is up to me. The last part was unmistakably sincere. Ouch. The fact I'd told him enough without coming completely clean about Ed's threats, my dad, and so much more, just drove a stake through my heart. For a second I considered coughing up the rest. But what good would it do? He knew I was hurting and in danger. If he knew Ed threatened my helpless father, too, Rabbit was just as likely to go off alone, ready to kill without any backup. The future was dark with certainty now. Rabid and his brothers were going to clash with the assholes blackmailing me. It was bound to end in blood. All I could do was watch and try to keep myself and the tiny collection of people I still cared about safe. You don't have to do anything, I said. God, I sounded so feeble. It was all I had. One last desperate attempt to convince him not to fight my battles— too bad I couldn't convince myself I'd ever be able to fight them on my own. Big Ed had a cannon pointed at my face, and I was holding a slingshot. I said thanks. Now get the fuck on so I can drive you home. It's a beautiful night. He was staring up at the sky, a serene look on his handsome face that didn't match the frustration in his voice. Everything's gonna be okay, baby, because I'm gonna make it that way. You just worry about being the best damn tutor in the city limits and figure out what else you want to do with your life. I'll make sure the shit's up in Oregon, leave you the fuck alone so you can have that chance. Awkward. Brutal. That was the return trip to Reading. The bitter gnawing sensation in the pit of my stomach just wouldn't go away. I'd just unleashed pure hell, and there was no putting it back in its box. And that was only half the problem— I couldn't stop thinking about the lost opportunity beneath the stars to taste his lips. If only once. My hands clung tight to his waist, harder than I really needed to keep myself steady on the highway. We were parked next to my apartment when I ripped the helmet off. Rabid waited for me to go, no doubt eager to be done with this miserable night. Instinct had something else in mind. Emotions broke loose in a torrent. I couldn't control myself any more as I climbed off the Harley and then threw my arms around his neck before he could pull away. Smashing my lips against his caused such a raw surge in every nerve I almost passed out. Time stopped, lost to the fire consuming us. It only took him half a second to react. He grabbed me, jerked my red locks tight in one fist, securing my face for his kiss, the full force of his lips swept me away like a lightning strike. For one sweet second there was total clarity. I couldn't move, couldn't think, couldn't do anything except taste him. I became the thudding beat in my chest and the molten desire in my veins. Desire opened up like a bottomless pit and swallowed my ego whole. His tongue pushed past my lips, opening me, exploring the rampant desire we shared to go deeper. Deeper. The very words set off an earthquake in my head, and it spread through my body. I was tingling and starting to shake all over as my blown-out senses came back. God, he tasted good. I could have stayed locked to him forever, hands splayed on his chest, 
scratching with need to find out how those sculpted muscles really felt underneath my palms. More questions, more curiosities, more dirty, nasty want. Would he growl into my mouth like this while I straddled him, riding his cock? How hard would he shame every boy I'd ever been with? Would I forget about the ugly scars on my face and all the fucked-up insecurities with my clit burning against his skin, sending me to sheer ecstasy, where nothing else mattered? Baby, fuck, he snarled his words, lust incarnate, when I tore my head away from his, breaking the kiss. I had to move faster to shatter his grasp. The wildfire in my body broke inside my brain, silenced by the questions and confusion raging through me. What the fuck was I doing? The inevitable freakout came, panic, fierce and relentless as the desire I'd had a second ago. I broke and ran. He called after me, but even the fire in his voice couldn't stop me. I turned my pocket inside out, pulling at my keys, shoving them into the lock. I flipped open the door and pressed myself flat against the wall inside. About a minute later, I heard his motorcycle's explosive roar, growling into the distance with as much feral disappointment as I had shaking me to pieces. I pushed past an idiot with a basket full of clothes, wet shame running down my cheeks, and collapsed inside my apartment. I was too fried to think. What happened at the abandoned ranch blew all my fuses, and the kiss outside ruined them for good. Tomorrow, I told myself I'd make one last-ditch effort at moving my father downstate and disappearing for good. He had enough left in his pension and savings to make sure he was taken care of. I didn't care if I ended up homeless. At least no one would die thanks to my poisonous debt and I'd never have to think about waking up to Rabbit some morning and seeing the disappointment on his face as he realized how fucked up I really was. He'd never get anything but a fling with a crazy pockmarked bitch like me, and I wouldn't even do that to either of us. I'd rather run like a fucking coward, leaving everything behind. It was all the mercy I could offer this man who'd tried his damnedest to help me. I wouldn't infect him with the same toxic regret I lived every day, just like I wouldn't open my heart to this big, demanding, tattooed sledgehammer. Ruin was his nature. Mine was making sure I didn't absorb any more savagery from anyone on a Harley. It didn't matter if Hurt came wrapped in fierce commands and the most lickable skin I'd ever seen mounted to two wheels. He was all pain, and I was too fucked up to absorb it. I couldn't. I had to go. The next day I woke with a pounding headache. Going through two hours of runaround at the nursing home didn't help. The bitchy administrators did everything in their power to stonewall my questions about moving him. Wasn't hard to see they were hell-bent on keeping him there forever. Anything to bleed what little remained dry. Around noon I stormed out. It was visiting time anyway, and for once I was looking forward to sitting down with my father after dealing with this shit. It might take my mind off the fact we were both in serious danger as soon as Rabbit's promises got to Big Ed. Dad slumped in his wheelchair near the usual window when I found him. He woke up groggy, irritated, just as confused as ever. I reached for his hand, warming his cold skin with mine. We're going to take a nice trip soon, Dad. Somewhere warmer. Better. I purred, trying to soothe him as much as myself. I just have to work out the nitty-gritty. I promise I'm going to keep you safe. His eyes lit up. For a second I swore he knew exactly who I was, and he sat up straight in his chair, reaching for my face. Why do you go through so much trouble for an old man? This place is downright tropical, girl. You know how fucking cold it got hauling salmon and crab into Anchorage? I laughed. I remembered exactly how brutal Alaska used to be during the cold months. Yeah, something had definitely given him back his wits today. Those were great times, Dad. Sometimes I wish we never left. I wish we hadn't moved here. Alaska might have kept me grounded. I wouldn't have run off and gotten into trouble because there was nowhere to run off to. He blinked. You kill trouble. 
Me and my brothers used to raise pure hell in the killers. This one time, the Prez asked us to do in this fat little bully. Bastard was a fisherman like me. He brought his crap north from the west coast to sell. Ice and heroin. Nothing our crew wanted anything to do with. He liked to beat his wife, too. I swallowed, wondering if he'd plugged the last few holes in his memories. Jesus, I hadn't thought of this story myself for several years. I hoped nobody heard him, or if they did, it was just crazy enough to chalk up to the ramblings of an old man out of his mind. Dad blinked again, and a knowing smile spread across his lips. We never enjoyed putting the sickos down like hogs. This one I did, because he led me to the woman who changed my whole damned life. Did you ever meet my wife, Aida? Maybe a couple times, I whispered. You know, we go way back. Yeah, I thought you looked familiar. My memory's not what it used to be. He cocked his head, seriously trying to remember who I was for a minute before giving up. Anyway, my Aida was just a bruised, beat-up, shaken little thing when I first met her. Didn't have a damned clue she'd end up becoming the best old lady a man could ever have. The best wife. She gave me a little girl before the sea took her home to heaven. My breaths were slower, shallower. That stupid headache hit its apex and finally began to wane, draining in the emotional climax this conversation was bringing. Why did his best days have to correspond to my worst? You don't worry about taking me anywhere, nurse. He reached over, gingerly patting my hand. You can't run from what life gives you. You gotta take it by the horns. The good, the bad, everything. Moving me out of this place won't bring me any closer to my girl. She's waiting for me when it's my time. And my Krista's out there, too. She's such a restless girl. He stopped, taking a good long look at me. You look a lot like her, you know that? Gorgeous red hair, just like hers. I turned away. My head was spinning, and the tears were coming. I wiped them, refusing to face him, trying to focus on his words. It was better than thinking about the hell, the disappointment, the wall I'd thrown up against Rabbit. I don't deserve to look like anyone you love. I've made too many fucking mistakes for that. It all came rolling out. I wish I could be the girl you're imagining. I shouldn't have expected him to have any clue what I was getting at. But when he squeezed my hand and I met his eyes, I believed he knew I was his daughter. There was dear old Dad, the headstrong badass, always ready to support me against the worst the world had to offer. I still hadn't gotten over the fact that I'd taken his money, too, for that stupid bar. You can't keep living your life with regrets, girl. I beat myself up for a long time over the shipwreck that took my wife. If I'd called off our anniversary surprise and hadn't sailed into that fucking storm, my little girl wouldn't have lost her mother before she could even know her. He sighed. I did some seriously reckless shit. I drank myself stupid. I rode long and hard up the Dalton Highway north of Fairbanks. My brothers in the MC knocked me down and drove some sense into my head before it was too late. Realized I had my daughter and Aida in my heart. When it finally sunk in... I couldn't do anything but live without looking behind me. Wise words. Wise and obscenely painful just now. It wasn't just the disease in his brain talking, either. The dad I knew always looked forward, never at the darkness in his wake. That was why we'd come to Reading. He was too old to work in fishing anymore, and his old MC mostly dissolved. Too many good men lost. Strong men I'd called uncles, growing up. We wanted to experience the world beyond pitch-black winters and bitter cold. He wanted to give me a better life, a chance at college, a place to settle down and build something. Maybe the fact that I'd blown it all to shit didn't really matter. I still appreciated everything he'd done. And damn it, he was right. So was Rabid. I couldn't keep living in constant fear. Terror sat heavy on my shoulders now that the Grizzlies were about to butt heads over my debt— but something was always bound to give sooner or later. Hey, you feeling better, girl? Don't tell me you're going to go out and waste another summer day on me. I'm an old man. It's your turn to have your place in the sun while you're young and pretty. I won't be responsible for wasting it. Time's more precious than you know. You understand me, Krista? 
My jaw practically hit the floor. My hands were shaking as they wrapped around his, and it took a long time to force down the lump in my throat. Too long. Dad? You know who I am? He paused, his eyes darkening a little more than I liked. Of course I do. You're that nice new hire they transferred in from Sacramento, aren't you? Over and done. Just like that. Slowly I pulled my hands back and then gave him one last pat on the shoulder as I rose. We'll visit next week. Same time, same place. He laughed, shaking his head. I sure hope so. Tell them to get me a new razor on your way out, dear. Fucking things never last more than a month or two. I can do that. Smiling, I headed out, into the waiting sun. Dad went through electric razors like nobody's business. He'd lost his mind and a lot of muscle, but his hands were still strong. The cheap blades wore down with how hard he pressed them to his face. Soon it probably wouldn't be an issue, whenever he reached the point where he couldn't shave anymore. He'd done the same thing sometimes at home, especially the older he got. Thick hair, he said, from too many years living a hard life in the cold. I believed he ran them too long because the whir of the blades reminded him of his motorcycle's growl. 4. So Bad It Hurts Rabid I was just sober enough to remember how fucking incredible her lips were on mine, how hot and eager and sweet her little mouth tasted. But I was also too fucked up to care, stumbling around like an idiot while Asphalt and I took turns at the dartboard next to the bar. Fucking shit, Rabbit! he yelled. Our colors aren't the friggin' bullseye! I laughed as he sped over to the wall where I'd planted my latest shot at least two feet from the actual board. I'd hit the corner of the clubhouse's old Grizzly's MC flag. Another foot over, anywhere on the bear's snarling face, and I'd have gotten a well-deserved beatdown from the brothers. Had a feeling I was fucked. I'd reached the point where inviting trouble sounded good. A few blows to the face might blast some sorely needed sense into my skull, or else make me forget all about Miss Hard to fucking get. Asphalt walked back to me, shaking his bald head. One more miss like that and you're done, brother. I'm not going to take the fall if any of the officers walk in on this shit. I grabbed the half-depleted bottle of Jack off the counter and swung it to my lips. Hot relief poured down my throat, harsh as lightning. Shit hit my guts and exploded, the next best thing to being pinned to the ground while Roman's fist plowed my face. I had to forget. Needed to. I'd flown way too close to that beautiful red-headed sun, and she'd scorched me for the last fucking time. Why the fuck was she so caught up on her goddamn face anyway? I knew those scars made her think she was ugly. But seriously, it's like the girl didn't own a fucking mirror. If she did, there should have been no doubt she was the hottest piece of ass who ever called this city home. Shit. There she was again, rooted deep in my brain, making me wonder how those soft red locks I'd held would contrast with the pert pink nipples I'd felt hardening against my chest. Missed fucking opportunities. My motor skills were too far gone to drink and walk at the same time. I drained another three shots in one big gulp and slammed into Asphalt's shoulder. Son of a bitch, he screamed. Hey, lady, look out! Some blonde chick I'd never seen before was walking through the bar. My heart pinched shut as the dart sailed right next to her face and slapped the wall. Uh-oh. Asphalt spun, slammed his palms into my chest. I took a swing at my very pissed-off brother and miss, dropping to the floor and landing right on my drunken face. Thank fuck it was numb. Asshole, what the fuck is wrong with you? Are you trying to get somebody killed? His boot connected with my ribs. The hot crack rippled through my chest. I rolled, tasting blood, laughing just the same. Christ, I was totally, completely fucked, twisting on the floor like a dumb kid who'd just had his first good joint. Asphalt was still screaming at me, stooped over, roaring in my face so loud and hard his words were almost incomprehensible. I felt his spit mist my face and reached up to wipe it off, trying to decide whether I should spring up and bust his jaw. Why should you? A disapproving voice piped up in my head. You're drunk off your ass, bro. But not so drunk you're blind to acting like a total asswipe. And not fucking drunk enough to forget her. Her. Krista Sexy Kimmel. Part Medusa, 
hot as she was stone cold. She couldn't be all woman. There had to be snakes hiding in her sweet red hair somewhere. This chick was turning me to dirt. Or was it rock? Fuck if Greek mythology had ever been my strong point. Another kick landed in my side. I heaved, sucking smoky air, trying to get the fuck up when I realized asphalt was gone. He'd gone over to apologize profusely to the woman who'd walked in. I was on my hands and knees, staggering up with some help from the bar's counter when I looked up and had my heart lodge right in my throat. Roman was heading toward me after leaving Blackjack's office, and he looked set on putting me out of my misery. Shit, I'm fucking sorry, bro. Me and Asphalt were drinking, we got a little carried away, and I— My mindless banter was broken by a hiccup. He was only a couple feet away now, close enough to smell the whiskey seeping from my pores. Get the fuck out of my way! Roman shoved me aside, heading for the leggy blonde. I held myself against the counter, only breathing easy when it was totally clear he wasn't going to split my skull in two. No, he was after the chick. They knew each other. Whatever was going on, it wasn't a happy reunion. The giant walked her over to a quiet corner where she disappeared in his shadow. Had to hand it to her. The mystery girl clearly wasn't intimidated, judging by the look on her face. Meanwhile, I was halfway sprawled across the bar top, ready to piss my pants when I thought our sergeant-at-arms was heading for me. Idiot. Thank fuck the clubhouse was sparse tonight, or I'd never live it down. Here! Asphalt's fist came down next to my face. The darts in his hand hit the counter hard. Clean this shit up and then take care of yourself. Seriously, brother? This is the only fucking break I'm cutting your ass if you keep wrecking shit tonight. I'm not your buddy, Brass. We shared an icy look, and then he was gone. Bastard was still shaking his wide cue ball head on his way out of the clubhouse. It took fucking forever to get the darts back by the board. Fine movements and motor control were a crazy dream. Crossing into Roman's line of sight, I tried not to draw attention to myself. It wasn't difficult, with his eyes anchored to the strange chick, speaking to her in low, hushed words. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but it was more than I had heard him talk since he was patched into our charter. I was about to head back when exploding glass vibrated through the air. Flattening myself against the wall, I spun as quickly as I could without falling to the ground to find out where the fuck it came from. A bottle lay in pieces at the blonde chick's heels. Her fingers twitched. Wasn't sure if she'd dropped it or thrown it. Her bright red face beamed fire at Roman as he stomped away, walking past me, heading for the clubhouse's depths. "'Go ahead and walk the fuck away again, you coward!' she screamed. "'At least this time I know it's not the prisons and the courts holding you back. You're not man enough to handle us!' Roman just kept going. The girl was playing with fucking fire, and she'd actually gotten away with it unscathed. I fully expected him to turn around and make her say that again, this time with his massive hand wrapped around her throat. No, the giant kept going. He was fucking out of there. Who the hell knew retreat was in his vocabulary? Hey, I blocked her path as she tried to follow him. What the fuck's going on here, lady? Who are you? Out of my face, she collided with my chest and tried to push me aside. The girl had fight, but I was much bigger than her. Heavy and stupid as an anchor in my fucked up state, too. She squealed as we spun together and I flattened her against the wall. Jesus Christ, calm the fuck down. I thought I was the only asshole in this bar making messes tonight. Her dark blue eyes flashed at me. Next thing I knew, her hands wrapped around my neck. Her fingernails sunk into my skin like little daggers, and she pulled me forward with all her might, trying to get my lips on hers. What the fuck? I broke free and went crashing against the bar. Gave me a minute to study her. Yeah, she was sexy on the eyes and freakishly willing. I knew that look in a woman's eyes. But I wasn't going to twine tongues with this weirdo who'd just been up close and personal with Roman. She wasn't the one I wanted. Didn't much fancy the beatdown I'd narrowly escaped from the enforcer, either. What's eating you? she demanded. I'm not pretty enough for you? Or are all the guys in this club just a bunch of pussies with mean tats and big muscles? It's not like that. I didn't owe her a damned explanation, but I gave it to her anyway, hoping it'd get this shit off my back. There's somebody else in my mind, babe. I might be sauce to the gills with Jack, but I'm not blind. I know you're not her. Whatever, the woman shrugged, wiping out her eyes. I'm Sally. She walked toward me, holding out her hand. 
I took it cautiously, gave it a quick shake. Did a quick look over my shoulder to make sure this wasn't some kind of bullshit trap set by Roman. Not that anybody needed much cause to punch my ass out cold tonight. Rabid. I turned away from her, jumped onto the bar counter, and reached for my bottle. You want to sit and have a nip of this or what? Sally took the invitation. I pulled out a glass and poured her a sloppy shot, cursed when the whiskey overflowed. She laughed. At least I was making somebody happy. I welcomed her company, mostly because she was giving me a way to dispose of this shit instead of pouring it down my throat, where it'd make me do even more damage. Seriously, how do you know, Roman? I've never seen him so pissed. Old flame, we had a good thing before he went behind bars. I heard the club changed, and I thought that meant he'd gotten over his crap, too. I was an idiot to come back here. I stared at the bottle, contemplating another shot. The idea made my bile churn, and I was man enough to realize I'd embarrassed my ass enough for one evening. No, Sally. No, you're not, I growled. If he doesn't appreciate what you tried to do, fuck him. My fist hit the table, and she jumped. I refilled her glass, sloshing Jack all over the counter. I was on a fucking roll, and I wasn't slowing down now. Drink up. Be proud of what you did. You're a sucker for love. Shit. Did I really say the L word? There's no shame in that. You don't need to feel stupid for tearing out your heart and offering it to this clown. Roman's a slow guy. It takes time for shit to sink in. Must be all that fucking iron he pumps when Blackjack's not having him chase us down. Too much testosterone clouds the brain. That boy bleeds it. The club's been under a lot of stress lately. She gave me a weak smile. What's your story? Are you just a natural at making girls you barely know feel better, or do you know a Roman, too? Uh, a female one, I mean. Just another lonely heart, I shrugged. Better off drinking to it than spilling tears, right? Fuck it. I could stand one more shot. I grabbed what was left in the bottle, clinked it against her little shot glass. She laughed again, and we downed our drinks together. We sat for a long while after, making small talk, mostly saying nothing at all. It was nice to have a companion in misery for a change. Of course, I wasn't going to tell her I'd created some of my own shit. Hell, I was still creating it, chasing the one chick who wanted nothing to do with me. Fuck if I could let go, knowing what the Klamath boys had over her, even if she hated my guts. Good luck, baby. Hope to see you again sometime. Try coming by in a few weeks. Maybe by then we'll have sorted through some of our shit. I hope so, she said. Thanks, Rabbit. I've got a feeling you'll sort whatever's got you by the balls just fine. Yeah, imagine that. I wasn't going to say it to her face, but Blondie was right. It was time to take my own advice. I wouldn't let her give up on the bruiser who turned her away. Shit, getting him laid to blow off some steam would be good for all of us. No contest. I wasn't giving up on Krista. Not till I had her soft red hair in my fist and my tongue jammed down on hers. I'd claim this chick one way or another, slap my brand on her the minute I was done slapping her sweet round ass. Fuck. That ass. She had a butt that was nice and full, begging to be spanked every time it rippled while she walked. I was a goner just thinking about it. There was no way, no how, no fucking chance I was giving up on squeezing it till she squealed. Didn't give a shit how many times she turned it toward me and walked away. One day soon I'd have it grinding on my lap, teasing my dick awake for the roughest, purest fuck of my old damned life. Then I'd grab her little ass so hard my knuckles went white, shove it up and down where it belonged, jacking myself off in her tight, wet cunt. Quitting wasn't in my nature. I always got what I wanted. Every single time. I couldn't stop thinking about having her naked, pressed up against me, moaning sin in my ear while I made her body shake like heaven. Her tits, her ass, every wild inch of her wound me up like the tightest spring the world had ever seen. On second thought, fuck the spring. That shit was too weak. No, damn it, I was more like a ticking time bomb, and when I went off, the whole fucking world would know, and so would she. That's how I got my name. I've always been that way. Dead set on getting my way first, second, and third. And God willing, I always would be. I'd spit fire and foam at the fucking mouth, psycho and rabbit as all shit, before I ever let something I set my sights on slip away. And I'd already let Crystal walk about one mile too many out of my grasp. When I reeled her in, I was going to pin her down and fuck her till my heart stopped. Just one night having her in my shadow was all I needed. 
Soon as I got her under me, that sexy, infuriating woman was never, ever going anywhere else as long as she lived. Standing up, it was easier to head for my room. My boots crunched over the mess of glass and whiskey dribbled all over the floor. Whatever prospect cleaned this shit up had his work cut out for him. A small hand slapped my chest in the hall, and next thing I knew, someone with a sugary perfume was hanging around my neck. Red. Everything I didn't fucking need was summed up in that word. Where have you been hiding, baby? Don't tell me you're into blondes now. She tugged my shirt down and started to stamp her lips on my chest, heading toward my face, fast and aggressive, how I liked. Took all my might to turn away from the temptation. But whatever the hell Krista planted in my skull was starting to sprout. Fucking anybody but her was settling for less, and I wasn't going to surrender to that shame. Get the fuck off. I need my sleep. Go find another brother to ride tonight. Growling, I pushed her away, trying not to hurt her as I shoved her to the wall. It held on awfully tight. Red's mouth dropped open. She shook her head. Don't do this, rabbit. It's her, isn't it? I've heard the rumors going around the club. You're chasing that bitch with the busted face like a baby. Busted face? You're goddamn lucky I don't give you one for saying that, I thought, all my evil senses sparking to life. Rage throttled my heart. I flexed my fists, forced myself to hold them down, despite how bad the jack in my veins wanted me to wrap them around her fucking throat and squeeze till she thought twice about insulting my woman. You don't know shit. How many times we need to go through this? My business, none of yours. If I want your sloppy fucking cunt, I'll ask for it. That's all I ever wanted from you, Red. You're a club whore. You're nobody's old lady unless they fucking say so, and you'll never be mine. Pure hurt swelled in her eyes. Anguish. Heartbreak. Too harsh? Maybe. But I had to get her off my ass, get her the hell away before I did something stupid, something that would cost me Krista for good if it kept up. Her lips quivered and she covered her breasts, suddenly ashamed of the see-through nighty I liked her to wear when we'd fucked. Shit, I couldn't even stand seeing it now without being disgusted, imagining how much better it'd be draped over Krista's big round tits. So, it's true. She shook her head, horror shining in her round face. I hate this club. I hate all the fucking changes since Fang died. It's making you stupid, rabbit, you and everybody else. It's making you soft. There you go, just like brass, chasing some bitch who doesn't give a shit about you or this MC. She doesn't even fucking love you. Why can't you see it? Why? Red flew forward, slapped both hands on my chest. Good thing my motor skills were coming back. I grabbed her wrists and shoved her against the wall, pinned her down till I saw the jealous rage in her eyes turn to fear. You fucking hit me again, I'll tear that flimsy top off and kick your ass out on the street. You can call a cab with your tits hanging out. You and me, we're fucking done, Red. Deal with it. Find someone else who wants your skank pussy or leave this clubhouse for good. You're lucky it's me. I clenched my teeth, getting up in her face. And the other full patch brother would have picked you up and thrown you in the fucking dumpster by now. I let go, listening to her sobs in the distance as she crumpled to the floor. Several doors swung open to see the commotion. I never looked back. Let them deal with that shit. I was going to bury myself in bed and sleep off the hangover. Tomorrow I'd wake up a new man. I'd sit down with the Prez and tell him everything about Krista's debt. Then, when the Oregon fuckers were dealt with, I'd ride back to her apartment. Whatever happened next, I couldn't say. Damn good chance it involved kicking down the fucking door and giving her a kiss she couldn't ignore, clenching her hot ass till there was absolutely, positively, no goddamn doubt in her head about who she belonged to. This time I wasn't taking no for an answer, and I sure as fuck wasn't going to let her run for me again. Blackjack called church early the next morning. I was up and moving, listening to the commotion in the halls, before Roman could get on my ass. I caught Brass in the hallway, grabbing for his cut before he could fly by. Hey, bro, what the hell's going on out here? He spun around and looked at me. Next thing I knew, he held up a blood-stained patch attached to a piece of fabric about the size of a palm. No bear on it. It wasn't ours. The furious-looking eagle was strangling a serpent on a desert backdrop. I couldn't place the symbol with any known MC. Uh, am I supposed to recognize this thing? Brass smiled and slapped my shoulder. Not unless you've been fucking around south of the border. This shit used to be attached to a living, breathing cartel boss. Just got word this morning. One of the organ boys killed the motherfucker yesterday and took this off him as a little trophy. 
Beheaded the sick son of a bitch. Same thing they've done to plenty of our guys in the old charter south. Our brothers up north caught those sneaky bitches trying to creep into Klamath and then circle around and hit us in the soft spot, all the warehouses we've got north. I didn't say a damned thing. My bro didn't wait for me to, either. He took off, marching into the meeting room. Several loud roars broke out when I heard him slap it down on the table. Dragging myself in, I was totally fucking numb. There was a ringing in my ears like a magnum firing next to my head. When Blackjack started talking later, it just confirmed my worst suspicions. Everything he said was like a dagger driving into my guts. I had to fold my arms just to make sure I wasn't really bleeding out all over the goddamn floor. They fucking did it, Prez. Organ reeled us a fish we haven't been able to snag for months. Believe me, I'm just as surprised as anyone. Brass looked more uncertain than when I'd seen him in the hall, his voice low and dark as he looked at our leader. Where do we go from here? Is this a sign we can trust Klamath again? It's a sign, all right. We'll treat them like our brothers unless there's a good reason not to. Blackjack spoke after a long pause, deep in thought. I'll be straight. I didn't expect shit after that phone call to rip, especially not after we roughed up their VP. Only question on my mind was when the bullets would start flying in this club again. Rip's a disrespectful little cocksucker, don't get me wrong. But until this morning, when Brass brought us the news, I was ready for war to bring this club into line. I looked up, my fists balled like iron. And now? You telling me we're not shredding those asses for carrying on Fang's fucked-up legacy? Blackjack shook his head. Shit happened in slow motion, driving the dagger in my guts deeper, harder. I wanted to fucking puke. We can't kill them when they're giving us their full cooperation, he said. It's not perfect. Rip's playing phone tag again. The jackass won't give me the specifics I'd like about how exactly they ambushed the high-ranking asshole that patch right there represents. He pointed to the bloody patch, and everybody stared at it. Shit's not important. I'll get the truth soon. What's important is what that thing there means. We took down an ace in the cartel. One down, four to go. Intel says trying to decapitate their leadership's the best way to finish the fuckers off. The boys who will take over if we kill the rest are so young and dumb they'll run back to Mexico with their tails between their legs. Blackjack paused. A couple guys coughed and the prospects shuffled nervously in the corner. Everybody was weighing the heavy shit settling on our shoulders. But unlike the other guys, I was being crushed, held under, and drowned by my own club doing this about-face. "'I can't ask Klamath to submit or die over their cat-and-mouse bullshit when they've given us this,' Blackjack continued. "'Obviously I don't trust them, not completely, but I'd be a damn fool if I didn't consider the possibility I was wrong.' My heart dropped like an elevator. "'Shit. Fuck. If Redding was about to kiss and make up with Southern Oregon, then that meant Ed was off-limits.' Blackjack wouldn't do shit to rock the boat. The best I could hope for was a slow, half-assed attempt at getting Krista's debt forgiven, if he'd hear me out at all. Rage shot through me. The stabbing sensation in my guts turned to fire, and I was ready to try lighting up the room like a goddamn dragon. I wanted to turn the fucking table over. My muscles flexed, tingling with the same adrenaline I'd felt every time I risked my life facing bullets for these colors. "'What's going on over there, rabid? You look like you got something to say.' Lay it out. You know we don't hide bad blood between brothers any more. Brass folded his arms. He'd been studying me the entire time. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Just then I hated my best friend for calling me out. I stood up. Blackjack's full dark eyes beamed over me like floodlights and all the brothers waited to hear what the fuck I had to say. You want the truth? I think letting Klamath off the hook's a serious fucking mistake. Unless that deceitful shithead they call their prez is gonna tell us every last bit about how they magically captured a cartel boss and killed him, we're making a lot of fucking assumptions here. My throat was so fucking tight I had to fight like hell to keep from shouting. Look, I'm happy as anybody about this damn thing. Wherever it came from, it means progress for every brother in this room. I reached for the blood-stained patch, picked it up, and gave it a good shake before letting it fall back to the table like a soiled leaf. Thing is, I think we were desperate to score a big win when we've been tangling with these fucks for more than a year. We're so shocked and surprised, so stupid with relief, we're letting our guard down. We can't do that. Not till we're sure the Oregon crew's full of real brothers instead of crafty fucking wolves. He's right, a voice boomed. Turning my head, my eyeballs almost popped out like a fucking cartoon when I saw it belong to Roman. This shit's too convenient, Prez. Don't fucking like it. Don't trust it. They knew we were about to make demands or go for the throat. 
That's why Ed was here in the first place, and now he drops this off for our Veep with a piss-poor explanation? Doesn't add up worth a damn, and you know it. Yeah? You two really want to have an out-and-out -out fight in this club after we just got done killing each other over Fang? Fuck that! Asphalt shot up, his face lined with anger. We're goddamn lucky it's a dead cartel boss's patch and not a bomb showing up on our doorstep. If the Oregon crew really wanted our asses dead, there's way easier traps they could set besides this. I'm willing to give these guys the benefit of the doubt. It's not like anybody at this table has any proof to call their story bullshit. Blackjack leaned back in his chair, gray hair folded around him like a lion's mane. Roman and I locked eyes. There was a brotherly understanding coupled with a desire to knock Asphalt's dumb head against the wall. Brother or not, I was sick of his cowardly, endlessly contrary shit. Rip, Ed, and his boys aren't the men I want in this M.C., the Prince said slowly. They're the club's past. Brutal. Fucked up. Selfish. But if there's a chance, I don't need to spill more Grizzly's blood when the bastards are cooperating. I'm taking it. We have a chance to reset things here before more brothers get hurt. If we start executing every asshole walking on the dark side right after they did us a big favor, we'll be on our way out like Fang's crew. This is the Mother Charter now. It's up to us to grab National by the balls and lead by example. You boys hear that? Asphalt grinned, looking to me and then Roman. Thank fuck the Prez has a brain in his head. If you guys had your way, we'd be letting the cartel walk all over us while we fucking kill each other. Smug motherfucker. That shitty, arrogant grin on his face reminded me of everything I was losing with this sick new truce. Everything threatening my girl. And no, I didn't give a single fuck that she wasn't officially mine yet. She would be. Mark my fucking words. And I was going to mark them in blood, too. I hopped on the table and went right for asphalt. He saw me coming when we collided. Hell opened up and yawned. Soon the room was filled with crashing, fighting, screaming brothers— I swung for the fucker's face, must have busted his lip a couple times over before he finally got his senses back and kicked me off him. I hit the wall, fell and rolled. Saw Roman on the floor next to me, two full patch brothers and three prospects trying to hold the giant down while he roared every vulgar name in the dictionary. Asphalt swung his bloody knuckles at my face. Would have been a direct hit if Brass hadn't ripped me off the ground and slammed me into the nearest wall. I struggled against him. He put his fucking hand over my face and squeezed, grunting as I drove my fist into his abs. Fuck. It was too hard to do any serious damage to him. I cared too much, even when he was choking me. Let me the fuck up! I screamed. I'll fucking kill him! Brass's hand disappeared. Something hard and furry smashed me across the face. When the stars stopped spinning in my eyes, I saw Blackjack had replaced Brass next to me, holding up the club's bear claw gavel with murder in his eyes. You're going to cut the shit right now, son, or you'll be losing a few teeth next. He lifted the claw over his head, ready to swing like a bona fide caveman. I blinked when I thought he'd hit me across the face again, but the claw hit the wall instead. Hard. Left a fucking hole in the old wood. The commotion slowed just in time for Blackjack to get on the table. He climbed faster than I expected for someone who'd taken a bullet to the leg just weeks ago during the final battle with Fang. Brothers! Shut your fucking mouths and put your fists down. Take a deep breath. Fill your lungs until they're going to burst. This isn't us. This shit all around you isn't brotherhood. Several men lowered their eyes in shame. Asphalt glared at me over Brass's shoulder. My friend had strategically positioned himself between us with the prospects to break up new fights. Even Roman stopped struggling on the floor, grunting through his teeth. You're welcome to disagree. You're welcome to call a vote on anything that's club biz. That's what the charter says. And it also says you're never supposed to come to blows with anybody else wearing this patch unless there's a damn good reason. He did a slow turn, making sure we could see the bear roaring on his cut. It was the same thing that bound us all together, our common bond. Kept me from beating fuckers like asphalt to a bloodless pulp when they weren't being so brotherly. Rabbit and Roman! He spoke our names, leaning down and looking at us with both hands on his knees. You're entitled to have this club vote if you want. You're clearly outnumbered, but we'll do it anyway if it'll help you settle the fucking rocks in your heads. Is that what you boys need to be saying, or what? There was a long pause. I shook my head. No fucking point. We were totally outnumbered. The enforcer was right behind me, refusing to meet the Prez's eyes. Look at me! That's an order! Blackjack growled. Roman did. No. No vote. 
he said, climbing on his feet as his handlers released him. All right, then it seems we're fucking done here. If anybody wants to start a fight again, he said, looking straight at me, they'll be answering to me and all their brothers for fucking up this club. We move as one. All we've got in this life is each other, understand? You can shake your head, you can rage, you can vote fuck no, but as long as nobody's spilling his brother's blood or draining his wallet, torturing innocents with no good reason like the man with this gavel before me, then you keep your goddamned hands to yourselves. If you've got a question about any of that, you bring it.